I think... yeah, good evening, sir. Uh, this is uh, Vijay Sharma. I would like, on behalf of Translumina and Abhumit team, I would like to thank all of you for uh, for your valuable time and uh, your presence uh, for this interactive session today on uh, uh, the complex PCI, managing complex PCI using uh, hemodynamic support, uh, in which uh, we have the international. Uh, Yes, uh, Dr. Said Bilazarian, Dr. Michael Lee, and uh, we have uh, the uh, our uh, faculty from India with the prominent uh, speakers, Dr. Ashok Sage, Dr. Praveen Chandra, Dr. Vishal Rastogi, Dr. Sharath Reddy, uh, Dr. Uh, Anant Raman, Dr. Manoj. Sir, am I audible? Yeah, you are. Yeah, because my colleagues are keep on asking me that I'm not audible. No, you are. So the uh, Dr. Vishal, uh, today for this particular uh, session, uh, you are moderating the session. So Dr. Vishal uh, is uh, our consultant at uh, Scott's Fortis Scott's Hospital. Uh, he's leading uh, international cardiologist, uh, done uh, uh, remarkable work in the field of international cardiology. So Dr. Vishal, uh, I'll hand over the session now to you. So please uh, start the session. Uh, sir, uh, uh, this presentation is, uh, uh, sir, this is your presentation? Uh, this is, I, I can unshare if, if you like. I, 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 I'm I happy to unshare if you'd like me to. No, it's okay. You can you can keep it there. So okay. uh, let me invite the chairpersons for the meeting. Uh, uh, we have, uh, first chairperson is Dr. Ashok Seth. He's the chairman of Fortis Escorts Heart Institute and the head of cardiology council of Fortis Group of Hospitals. Uh, he's uh, uh, been awarded with the National Order of Pad Padma Shri in 2003 and uh, Padma Bhushan in 2015 and BC uh, Roy National Award for the most eminent medical person in the country by the President of India in 2017. I also invite uh, Dr. Michael Lee. He is the consultant cardiologist and director of cardiac catheterization laboratory and honorary clinical associate professor of the Queen Elizabeth Hospital, Hong Kong. And uh, he's also Lee Kashing, faculty of medicine at University of uh, Hong Kong. I also invite the panelists for this, uh, Dr. Viveka Kumar, who is the principal director and chief of cath lab at Max Hospital, Saket. Uh, Dr. Ravindra Rao, who is the chairman of Rajasthan Hospital, Jaipur. Dr. Anupam Jaina is the interventional cardiologist at Kalinga Institute of Medical Sciences, Bhubaneswar. Dr. Girish Navasundi, he is interventional cardiologist at Apollo Hospital, Bangalore. Dr. Jimmy George, he is the consultant interventional cardiologist at Lizzie Hospital, Cochin. Uh, Professor P.K. Hajra is HOD, Cath Lab and Cardiology, Emory uh, Hospital, Kolkata. Dr. Ravi Kumar is uh, an interventional cardiologist uh, at uh, uh, Medicover Hospital, Vizag. Dr. R.K. Jain, he is a senior interventional cardiologist at Kim's Hospital. With this, uh, we start the today's uh, proceedings. And the first talk is going to be by Dr. Uh, Seth. Uh, Balazarian with on overview of Impala in real world and clinical settings. Over to you, Dr. Seth. Great. Well, thank you very much to for everyone for the invitation. Thanks to our chair persons, Dr. Seth and Lee. I'm really delighted to be with you. And uh, I'm Seth Balazarian. I'm an interventional cardiologist. I practiced in the greater Boston area for 25 years until joining Abiumed five years ago. And, and I want to provide some perspective for interventionalists and others on the call about Abiumed, about our new technology, a little bit about protective PCI and shock. And I know there's some important uh, conversations that will be going on throughout the next couple of hours. So thank you again for the invitation. So so with that, I'll just begin right away by just making sure that everyone knows that really we have a global mission to recover heart muscle and save lives with percutaneous heart pumps and oxygenation technologies, enabling safer, more effective treatment and therapies for high risk, urgent and emergent patients. So that's high risk PCI and that's shock, of course. And, and some patients that uh, we've treated from around the world uh, are shown here. Um, uh, I, uh, we're very uh, fortunate to have uh, many times physician, uh, these patients come and visit us and see our manufacturing facility and meet our team that, that develops these products. So, so with that, uh, that really is our goal to collaborate with you as the physicians providing the care to provide with you with the needed technology. So just some high level about the company. Uh, Abumed has uh, uh, been uh, working around the globe and I'll just highlight, uh, obviously we have in the United States, approval for use in high-risk PCI and shock. We also have a right-sided device. Uh, we have approval in, in Europe, in J Japan, and uh, really have had dramatic growth in the last several years with now over 170,000 patients treated in US, Germany, and Japan uh, as our global experience grows. 
a, a brief word about the company. I think that is just interesting. We're celebrating our 40th anniversary this year. The company started 40 years ago to develop a replacement technology to actually replace the heart. In the age of uh, the Apollo moon launch and other technology advances, uh, this was developed as a strategy to replace the heart. But over time, it became clear that a strategy not of replacing, but then assisting and ultimately enabling our own hearts to recover was really the best strategy. And about 14 years ago, the company Abumed acquired the Impella technology and subsequently has really transitioned to a platform of minimally invasive strategies to improve outcomes for patients. And you know about Impella, and obviously uh, I think that uh, this today's focus is largely about Impella, but uh, we really are making significant advances in artificial intelligence and cloud-based technologies to assist with decision support for physicians to help physicians do a better job taking care of patients. But also we've acquired an ECMO platform. We're very excited about this ECMO platform and, and hope to bring this to you as well. Uh, this platform does not require oxygen or uses an oxygen concentrator and some other very unique technologies that we think will really advance ECMO uh, de care delivery. Our, our engineers are really, I think, uh, a phenomenal group and they are focused in the last year and this year and moving forward in these three broad strategy areas to make our technology smaller, smarter, and connected. And the small, of course, is understandable, making the smaller arteriotomies to deliver technologies. Smarter is to really give it decision support for all those things you see for weaning guidance, to actually supplant the use of a right heart catheter to help identify right heart failure and to provide right heart hemodynamics. And connected is really an important element as well to be able to visualize the care of patients on, uh, on smartphones and other strategies remotely. Our newest uh, technology acquisition just occurred this week. Uh, Dr. Naveen Kapoor and colleagues at Tufts were inventors of a, a technique of a strategy technology strategy called Precardia, which is a superior vena cava balloon that uh, 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 enables physicians to reduce preload on the heart in the setting of uh, acute decompensated heart failure and shock. And we're very excited about this. It's still uh, more than a year of development will be required with clinical evidence generation and uh, regulatory approvals. But uh, just a, another example of our commitment to being the first and only really manufacturers in the space of MCS devices. So we are of course a, a global company. Uh, the, company the countries that uh, we uh, uh, are, uh, have the greatest penetration in, of course, companies with reimbursement as the US, Germany, and Japan, but very proud to be in India as well, as well as in um, Hong Kong where Dr. Lee is. And excited about to be uh, growing around the world in our, our presence in helping patients. Our company has uh, really, in the last year, has really pivoted to one that's really committed to more clinical evidence generation. Now we've moved from approvals to really optimizing clinical evidence with a variety of randomized controlled trials. We have an ongoing STEMI trial looking at the use of Impella to reduce infarct size in patients without shock. That's the STEMI door to unload study. We also are just beginning enrollment in a study called Protect4 looking at high-risk PCI, comparing a strategy of doing fast and quick in and out strategy versus an Impella supported strategy. And Recover4 will be an AMI cardiogenic shock study. And several other uh, studies are ongoing and, and beginning around the world uh, in this clinical evidence, evidence generation for both the Impella platform and our Breathe ECMO platform. Transitioning briefly now to just protected PCI, uh, I know that there's some important cases, including Dr. Seth will be, spe Seth will be speaking next on a, on a PCI case, but this is really a growing population around the world. And I know uh, when I finished my training 30 years ago, complexity was defined as mild angulation and eccentricity, things that are laughable now because we only had balloon angioplasty then. And now you are all treating these very complex patients with complex lesions and complex anatomy. But that comes oftentimes with also hemodynamic compromise and a variety of other risk factors, which really put these patients at great risk. And so really this constellation of symptoms of complex coronary disease, patient comorbidities, and hemodynamic challenges really put patients in a circumstance that could be very challenging, not just to get them through the procedure, but to optimize their outcomes so that they do well without stent complications and other issues after discharge. And I just show this as just a very quick and high level uh, of what we know. And the PROTECT2 study was the randomized control trial comparing balloon pump to Impella. That's the red 
and the balloon lines. And what I've added here is the PROTECT3 study, the most recent data, which is 2017-2019 of PROTECT3 patients that were like the PROTECT2 patients. And you can see that if you look at days zero to three, there's really no difference in outcomes. And what I have learned as uh, working with Abby in the last five years is that physicians will titrate their care. They will actually get patients out of the lab safely and be discharged safely, but they're not always able to optimize outcomes, to optimize minimum lumen diameters, stent apposition, atherectomy, and other strategies without hemodynamic support. And if they don't do that, the patients may suffer consequences out to 90 days and beyond. And this has led us to the design of the PROTECT4 study, which will follow patients out for three years, because we really believe that the hemodynamic support and the enabling aspects of optimizing revascularization will make an important impact on outcomes. One other data set I'll just show you, which are our real world evidence data collections is the RestoreF study, which was also pre presented at TCT in addition to PROTECT3. And this was a fascinating study looking at the objective metric of ejection fraction at 90 days after multi-vessel protected PCI at US sites. And this showed really this impressive 10% improvement in ejection fraction, in addition to a marked improvement in angina and heart failure symptoms at 90 days with patients who underwent multi-vessel protected PCI. So our clinical evidence pathway to a class one recommendation is shown here. In the middle is the identification and validation of best practices. This is not unique to Impella. It's true for TAVR and every other device that's ever come to market. What's learned as the device is used is very important to optimize its outcome. And PROTECT3 and RestoreF, I very quickly just showed you, but now we're moving to a, a, another randomized control trial to optimize outcomes for uh, patients and move to a class one guideline. Shifting now briefly to shock, there are a variety of strategies and uh, devices that you I'm sure know about that are in the marketplace or, or have been are being developed for hemodynamic support in shock. They're shown here. But uh, I think it's uh, very simple to sort of simplify the strategy of, of treatment in shock to two, uh, two goals. One is, uh, this is a quote from Dr. Sanjog Kaura, who I know has presented at this forum uh, previously. Dr. Kaura refers to this as feeding the body and saving the heart. And the circulatory support is of course feeding the body and, this, and the saving the heart is the ventricular support and coronary perfusion. And you can see these different techniques shown here. Only the Impella platform does both. It feeds the body and saves the heart. And so I think it's a very simple way to think about the hemodynamic support strategies of these different tools. One of the things that I think is important though about any tool is shown here. And this is, I think, a really fascinating natural history study using our Impella Coli database in the United States. You can see of over 3,000 patients before the pre-market approval in the United States, the use of the Impella's impact on survival was really just a random distribution. We weren't allowed to teach and identify best practices to improve outcomes. And you can see it was just a random or Gaussian distribution. Some people had very low survival, some people had high survival, and the average was 51%. But after we were able to identify best practices and really teach about them and encourage physicians to use best practices, you can see it's no longer a random effect. And we actually moved up the median survival. And you can see there's more sites performing at a higher level uh, subsequently. And in the US alone, it, it translated to 4,400 more patients surviving to explant uh, since that time where we began educating on best practices. So some of the best practices that Dr. Bill O'Neill has identified for our Impella Quality Database and published on, of course, are the importance of using the Impella pre-PCI in shock, hemodynamic monitoring to guide the device, to use a right heart catheter to guide decisions about weaning and escalation, other important things, as well as the really critical importance of, of de-escalating and removing inotropes in the cath lab at the end of the AMI cardiogenic shock treatment. So Impella pre-PCI, do the PCI, and then get the inotropes off in the cath lab. The Impella pre-PCI is not just for the Impella quality database. It's very impressive that in all of these data source sets, some of them that were not dedicated to Impella, but when we were able to get these data sets and look at the Impella pre-PCI versus post-PCI, you can see there's a survival association in every one of these data sets. The yellow Impella pre-PCI versus the post-PCI, in every data set that, that's been looked at around the world. 
So here are the five key learnings that have really happened that we really need to identify and support cardiogenic shock early. There really is a golden hour. The longer patients stay in shock, the more likely they are to die. We need to aggressively down titrate inotropes. We need to identify patients that may need more support. A minority of patients need more support than the Impella CP and AMI cardiogenic shock right-sided support or more left-sided support, less than 10%, but in those that do need it, we need to identify them. We need to identify those with RV dysfunction and take appropriate action. And we really need to guide treatment with right heart catheters uh, for escalation and weaning. So you may know that just two weeks ago, the, uh, the National Cardiogenic Shock Initiative presented their final results. And so just briefly to review their algorithm of best practices shown here, identify best practices, activate the cath lab, put in ephemeral access. And then once you confirm that the patient is having an AMI with cardiogenic shock, you could confirm that with echo or left heart cath, measuring the EDP or right heart cath, you then go ahead and put the impella in, the impella CP. And then once the impella is, is placed, a PCI is performed. And then at the end of the procedure, a right heart cath is done to evaluate whether left-sided support, more left-sided support is needed, right-sided support is needed, or whether the patient is, is gonna do well and can be uh, transferred to the ICU for continued care. And this is their final results, looking at the uh, sky shock C and D in the NCSI versus those uh, all comers versus compared to IABP shock, culprit shock, and the original shock study, showing improved outcome out to 30 days uh, in these patients. When you look at how this uh, group has done compared to the uh, prior randomized controlled trials, there's really been this step up of about 20 to 30% in absolute improvement in survival uh, compared to the earlier randomized controlled trials. And on the right, you see a single center experience, which was published in Jack about two years ago from the ANOVA Heart and Vascular Institute in Fairfax, Virginia in the US. And what they did is they looked at their experience with Impella and all shock care before they started to use a standard uh, uh, goal-directed strategy using these best practices, and their survival was 44%. And in just 18 months, with a commitment to these best practices, they raised the survival to 82% in their own experience. And so uh, what I've shown you today is that um, at a high level, Abiomed uh, has a mission to, uh, to improve outcomes. I showed you a little bit about our technology platform, including the Impella, Smaller, Smart, and Connected, as well as the ECMO platform and Precardia, which we've just acquired. I showed you very quickly our plan to use a, a real-world evidence pathway, moving to a class one guidelines with a randomized control trial. And lastly, I showed you a little bit about the emerging data on AMI cardiogenic shock. So I hope that kicks off our meeting. And I want to thank you again for the invitation and delighted. And thanks again to all who invited me and to our chairpersons, Dr. Shok and Sven Lee. Thank you, Dr. This was a, a very elegant presentation. and We have very exciting times ahead. Uh, I now invite uh, Dr. Seth uh, for his presentation of a single access uh, technique case, uh, a complicated chip case. Uh, you're muted, sir. No, but you're not audible. Muted. He's mute, muted. No, he's not muted, though. Up to you. No, you are. Sounding. Uh, yeah, now it's better. Now? now, yeah, it is better. Yeah. Okay. So, Seth, uh, that was a great talk. Uh, we'd like you to stay back uh, for the further discussions because I'm sure certain clarifications may need to come up and your input would be valuable. And at the same time, Michael, uh, you know, you, there is going to be some discussion. We hope you have time for discussion and going to be really looking forward to your comments on many of the cases. And finally, I just request everyone to stick to time. Uh, this is going to be 10 minutes and 10 minutes no more, because if you're going to have time for discussion, which is absolutely essential for a good meeting, then we must stick to time. Otherwise, we will have no time for an interaction. With that, I think I'm going to share my slides and move ahead. Sorry. Okay. I'll soon share it. So if you excuse me for, for this. 
share screen. And I hope that I see my slides somewhere here versus right here. And I will share. Do you see it now? Yeah, it is there. Okay, so, so I hope I have the timer on. Uh, no talk on Impella from India can go without a throwback on the contributions to India to the field of mechanical step circulatory support, especially Impella. And I take you back to the first case in Asia Pacific region, uh, which was 19th April, 2007, when very few cases had been done across the world. This was a case of cardiogenic shock, a guy with triple vessel disease who had an MI, who was in shock, who was in balloon pump and on a ventilator in, in Jaipur, who was then shifted by air ambulance to us. And we took him up with a triple vessel disease, which was known in this patient. And we were revascularized him completely on an impeller. 19th April, 2007 was a landmark day when impeller started in Asia Pacific region. Uh, this was his revascularization, the triple vascular revascularization. Five days later, this guy had actually been extubated and was discharged from the hospital looking good. And he continued on for many years after that. He was a doctor, he continued on for many years after that to live and lead a good life. And that was the first start of Impella. But even the greater contribution of ours to the world was the first ever live transmissions of Impella. And I love to have this throwback because just puts us the, the perspective. We from India transmitted the first ever live cases of Impella to the main arena of the TCT, the first Impella cases ever demonstrated live at this DCT, this was 2007, and this is in the main arena, as you can see. We were doing these cases at uh, 12 to, uh, to two at night, and Vishal and, and uh, both Praveen were an integral part, how we transmitted these cases. And this is, of course, the we then had into the into the Kauri Theater. And I'd say this was the most beautiful demonstration of treacherous cases, as Jeff Moses said. In a patient who actually arrested five minutes before our live transmission, and they saw us coming on, with our cardiac massage going on. And then we were able to complete that procedure and keep the patient alive. Let me just take you through the single access issues. Let me just give you this example of the live case of the CHIP CTO India, the meeting which I hold for every year for the last uh, three years. In 2021, we did this case earlier on in February this year, 78 year old male, insulin dependent diabetic, recent MI. He had his MI was around uh, three weeks old. He, during this time, presented with pulmonary edema, which got better, but then he re went into, he was again into pulmonary edema. His ejection fraction was 30%. He'd had an angio at another center demonstrating triple vessel disease with severely, severely elevated pulmonary artery pressures. PET scan had shown viability in all the three areas of his myocardium. You can see this is his coronary artery disease. He's got significant calcified proximal right coronary artery stenosis, and he's got diffusely diseased left system with extensive calcification of uh, coronary arteries down the circumflex as well as the LED. And you can see that that actually extends from the left main onwards all the way down to mid LED. There's diffuse distal LED disease as well, which would have been too extensive to revascularize. And his PA pressures, as you know, were elevated. We had, by the time he came to us, his PA pressures were 50, but he needed complete revascularization. He had viability. And therefore, this was an impella supported PCI. Just to take you through the sing impella single access procedures, it, it's got its own in, 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 in inherent advantages. Uh, limited vascular access uh, reduces the number of accesses as well as decreases vascular complications. So once you've got a large bore access on one side, you have the ability to use two put two catheters to this device. You must remember that it's only can be done with an impeller CP, which is a 14 French impeller uh, catheter, therefore has that sheath, the larger sheath. Uh, and uh, the way to do it is, of course, we got uh, at either 10 or 12 other places that we puncture, and we use a micro puncture needle. We've done it in a number of cases now, and this is exactly how it goes. I hope you can hear the sound. Can you hear the sound? Okay. So there's a micro puncture needle parallel. Don't go angulated. If you go too much outwards, you're going to hit, you're going to hit the base of the valve and not go through. Remember the valve, the passage is central. And so what you've got. 
So you can do use an 18 gauge needle, but that's larger, can hit your impeller. So I use a dilator to dilate that 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 diaphragm because it just makes everything easier. This is a destination pinnacle destination sheet from Terumo. This is a very important step, holding the shaft of the impeller, holding the shaft of impeller all the time when you actually dilate the sheet. And, and, and then, of course, you go to the sheet. The sheet terumo is a hydrophilic coated sheet, and that's why it has the advantages. Though the proximal eight centimeters of it are uncoated and non hydrophilic. 45 centimeter. And again, hold on to the impella catheter. And this sheet goes in very smoothly because it's hydrophilic coated till it comes to the uncoated area. And this only can be done, by the way, in 14 in impella CP sheet, which is a 14 French sheet. It cannot be done with a 13 French impella 2.5 sheet. Push. In the non coated area, you can see it's a bit of a push. And therefore, a 45 centimeters is more advantageous. And so you will now just intubate it into the coronary. And because you've got a larger protrusion, because you have a longer sheet, so you've got to be careful about the 45 is the ideal sheet. Anyway, moving ahead, we can discuss about this, but you can't put an eight French sheet. You can put a six French sheet. Uh, and uh, we, there have been tests with various types of sheets, but we must remember that this hydrophilic coated seven or six French teruma pinnacle 45 centimeter is the ideal one. Let's see what we did with this case finally. OCT could not cross this lesion. And therefore, this was uh, treated with a two millimeter compliant balloon to, and it crossed it partially. Now that is, you can see that that's fairly calcified lesion. The balloon's not opening up the lesion. So having done that, we have two options. We have the option of rotational atherectomy. We're not getting the greatest support from the guiding catheter, it goes in. But remember, we are very short on the guiding catheter here on the right side because of our long sheet. So here we'd go ahead and we decide to put in a a two into two millimeter OPN and at 35 atmospheres. Now this is where if I've done an OCT after, after the balloon dilatation, I would have got a sink impression. I should have rotoblated the lesion prior to the OPN because even an OPN at 35 millimeter is constraining the IVL and therefore I, I'm sorry, is constraining the, uh, is constrained at 35 atmospheres. So I go in with an IVL and deliver 80 pulses at that point, which shows partial expansion of the balloon. Uh, and then of course, those, the, what's the great, here's an OCT run demonstrating that what actually was, I'll, I'll show you that later, but in the interest of time, there was a nodule at that particular point, a 2.75 into 38 millimeter Zions expedition up to the ostium went in and followed this by, a, by, a, uh, by an OPN, uh, three millimeter because I knew the sizing of the vessel on the OCT at 40 atmospheres. And there we have an excellent result and a post OCT run demonstrating ex a very good expansion of this tent with no significant residual stenosis all along. 
and certainly the dilatation of that area which had a nodule and extensive calcification, which was an undilatable area, even with an OPN balloon. Moving on to the left side, we have started having more issues, but you know, this, this device, uh, Impella CP allowed us to do all that to the right coronary artery. We went ahead and dilated the circumflex and stented the circumflex. We also meant to, by the way, open up that OM. But what we happened as we see in this next picture is, is as soon as we'd implanted the stent into the circumflex, we had hypertension, transient, could be supported by ramping up the impeller, chest pain, and there was slow flow, and you can see extensive uh, air embolism throughout. Uh, we were able to support this situation and get out of it with autoperfusion over a period of five minutes. And you can see gradually, you can see on the left side, flow stopped all across. You can see subsequently that flow return, and over a five minute time, we then proceeded and got the patient out of this problem and proceeded to rotablator of the LAD. That was the culprit vessel. We rotablated extensively along that LAD over a period of time, but then again, had the patient started having ST segment elevation, and that was due to slow flow in the LAD enclosure of the diagonal, a huge diagonal branch, as you can see, that's on the right side. You can see the huge diagonal branch gone. Again, some degree of hypertension. Again, ramping up the impeller, supported the patient very well, infused SNP distally, dilated the D2 flow restored, as you can actually see now, and that's looking better. And again, situation started resolving and therefore went ahead and did a bifurcation stenting of the LAD diagonal with a tap to the diagonal. And you can see that on the right frame, and we now have a good result. But you see extensive proximal calcification. So while the lesion, which was soft and uh, the culprit, uh, uh, created the slow flow, we have extensive proximal calcification. So another 3.5 millimeter IVL to the proximal segments. And you can see that heavy calcification and 80, 80 uh, pulses delivered out there. You can still, still see the residual stenosis. And this was rototripsy. So went in with the post stent, we dilated it with a NC at 30, 26 atmospheres. Went it with a stent, still had a residual stenosis, you can see. And that, by the way, I'd also dissected the left main by that time, so sent it all the way anyway to the LAD. And then I see in the residual stenosis, you have an OPN at 40 atmospheres, 35 atmospheres, and you can see that at 40, the waste disappears. But the waste disappeared, and so did a perforation come along. So again, we're nicely supported by the patient. Balloon inflation at that particular point immediately brought in a graph faster, 3.5 into 18 implanted the gas graft master at the perforation site, dilated up to by this time, of course, after implantation, we didn't stop the leak on the left side, went up with a four millimeter NC at 22 atmospheres, stopped the leak, did the optimization, did a pot, and of course we did an IVUS as well to actually demonstrate the fact that we had a good result, good flows, optimal result, even in the stem graft. And the patient throughout, despite the complications, was well supported on impeller. And the patient went home fine. Both IWAS as well as uh, sent boot images showed extremely good result. Patients are four months out. His ejection fractions improved to 40%. He's actually walking around to four kilometers and doing well. Now, what this actual case demonstrates is that through a single axis impeller, one could actually do all this. But important aspects said that the impeller CP supported the patient despite multiple complications. I could have avoided the perforation had I done an OC, uh, OCT or I was prior to doing my extensive high pressure OPN dilatation at 40 atmospheres. However, I think I was just rushing through that by that time because I had had a long case and I missed that important step. The important aspect is that single access I did find uh, tedious to go through single access, access with multiple guide catheter changes and manipulation of the guides. And therefore I feel that single access is better when less manipulation of guides is needed, when you actually have less extensive revascularization than triple vascular vessel revascularization needed. And I think as we go along, we've done now three of these cases, but as we go along, we are actually getting better and better at our single access impellers. Thank you very much for your attention. By the way, I would have loved to see the clock, which I did not. So I am therefore uh, would certainly emphasize on the on the on the coordinators or whoever is at the background to get the clock up. Thank you very much.
Thank you, sir. Uh, we now move on to the uh, next presentation, which is by uh, Dr. Praveen Chandra. He's the chairman of uh, cardio interventional cardiology at Medanta Medicity, and he's also been awarded uh, with the Padam Shri in 2016 by the President of India. Over to you, Dr. Chandra, for your uh, case of uh, Akpela in cardiogenic shock. Okay. Thank you, Vishal. I think, you know, <clears throat> as Dr. Seth was mentioning, that our experience started very early, but we lost it in between for 10 years, I think, maybe 10 years, uh, we couldn't do any cases because the device was not available. And now the device is available and we have now so much data, which is, uh, and of course, experience from many, many interventional cardiologists from all over the world. And so with this, uh, we have moved on also. And now I'm going to share with you a case uh, where a uh, patient actually, and this was the time of uh, last, uh, the first dose of uh, the first wave of uh, this uh, COVID in India, which was in July and a lot many patients were coming in and it was very difficult to straight and take the patient to the cath lab. So this patient who was uh, intubated outside uh, the hospital and he was uh, brought in with the, uh, you know, uh, ventilation and he was intubated he was in cardiogenic shock. He was put on an intraortic balloon pump as soon as he arrived in the ICU, which was a COVID ICU because he had to be kind of, uh, you know, tested for, and that time RT-PCR took about, you know, at least 12 hours to get the results. So he came in the evening, he was put on a balloon pump. He was stabilized for a while. And uh, next day when the RT-PCR reports came in, we decided to take him to the cath lab. So when he came to the cath lab, while he was being shifted, he had a cardiac arrest. So when he had a cardiac arrest, so we started while he was being put on the table. So we started, you know, doing CPR and all those things. And of course, uh, at that time, the situation was quite critical. We were not sure what to do. He was low ejection fraction. He was having a, you know, really bad situation. And we had initially planned to put an impella and do a procedure if, if required. But here, what we see is that this was the initial ECG when he came in, but uh, Events, uh, you know, this episode of VT and cardiac arrest was controlled. He was taken, uh, we decided what to do. So at this stage, we decided that we might have to put him on an ECMO first so that we support him, we maintain circulation, and then only we will be able to go ahead. So we put him on a ECMO, VA ECMO through the right femoral axis. And at that time, you know, you can see that, you know, these uh, gases were pretty bad. The lactates came up to 8.6. So we put him on a ECMO, which is four, and at 4.35 liters, we were able to achieve a reasonable circulation. The pressures were up. And at this stage, we thought that it may be reasonable to start and do the interventions, do the angiogram first. So the angiogram was done from the left femoral axis and the ECMO was from the right femoral axis. And what we see here again is not very uh, interesting because the disease is so bad, triple vessel disease, diffuse disease, we were not sure as to what, where do we start? So we said, okay, let us start with the LAD because LAD is uh, quite, you know, uh, dis you know, long disease though, but still we will, we will be able to salvage it. So we started uh, doing the LAD. We put in a wire here, uh, which was, I think, uh, as a heavy support wire, all-star wire, because when we do uh, in such, uh, you know, fibrocalcific lesions, we have to use OPN balloons. We went up to 40, 50 atmospheres. And uh, we got a reasonably good job done in the LAD. And at this stage, we thought that it may be reasonable to just you know, see if the patient remains stable, we will bring him back a little bit later. But, uh, and also at this stage, we thought, let us put the, uh, you know, uh, this uh, impella as a LV vent because the EF is so low. If we just continue ECMO, he will not be able to sustain it for too long. So we put in the, from the left side, we checked the, access, the access was okay. We had done a good puncture in the high up because we wanted to make sure initially also that the puncture should be good because this is something which is very important. And so here you can see that the puncture is reasonable. So we went from the left side and we put in the, you know, this is an impella CP which was implanted. And this is the shot which we took after that. As you can see here, it looks quite okay. And now what has happened is that after the impella, everything was looking so good. So we thought that maybe we'll just bring him back to the ICU and see how things uh, fare after this. 
So ECMO was on, Impella was on, his LEDs dilated, and the flow is quite good. But as soon as we went out of the lab, uh, as soon as I went out of the lab, suddenly I see back that you know he's again showing bradycardia and hypotension and all those things. So we thought maybe that the stent is occluded. So we checked the stent. It was okay. Now which axis will you take? We didn't have the single axis at that time. So we said, okay, let us uh, go from the right radial. So we went from the right radial. This is the injection which is done from the right radial, as you can see here. There's a right radial injection. The stent was fine. Everything is looking all right. So we then decided to, uh, this is, uh, we went from the right radial and we did the right artery. So this is the right artery, which was treated at that time by the balloon dilatation and then stenting. And this was the right artery, although it was not occluded, but still we thought it may be contributing to some, maybe, you know, uh, this of uh, hypotension, which happened. So we did the intervention because we had already accessed this and then the lactates did started declining. His ECMO was put at three liters and Impella at 1.8 liters and he was brought down. And this is the, you can see the pressures and uh, everything was looking all right. And uh, we can, we, of course, you can see that the LV is so bad. So we kept monitoring him and he started showing improvement. His PA pressures started coming down and he was maintained on a heparin infusion with ACT of 182 to 220. Lasix infusion, urine output was very good. He started pouring in like, you know, a completely nice uh, hemodynamics. His femoral axis were clean. There was no, everything was looking very good. But the only problem is that his neurological status was quite impaired because he did have an insult before coming in. He did have a neurological insult while he was being shifted. He had an arrest. And since he arrested before being taken on the table, so it was a time gap which happened. So although his peoples were initially reacting, but uh, we kept checking him every day for the next three, four days. We were quite well on hemodynamics with the ECMO and Impella. And we wanted to reduce the ECMO and uh, then gradually take it off and continue with Impella for a while. And then you know, continue following him with, with the you know, uh, echo on every day. And you can see that uh, things are looking good. Lactates came down to 1.4. And uh, his pressures are good. His PA pressures were 37 by 12. So everything was fine. He had some issues with the, you know, this mucus plugs in the lungs, so which we have taken up the bronchoscopy. So things were doing nicely. But the problem was that this patient did not actually uh, have any neuro meaningful neurological recovery. So at this stage, we thought that it may be reasonable to just bring out the you know support and just you know pull out everything because his neurological damage was almost complete so just to show that you know this kind of uh, therapy works very well in a patient who has a cardiac arrest but certainly we have to make sure that the neurological uh, you know uh, recovery is going to happen or it is intact so Empella and ECMO as a combination therapy in cardiogenic shock is a good idea. It gives oxygenation support, end organ perfusion, and of course, LV and loading for myocardial recovery. And these are the, you know, the, uh, the outcomes, as you can see here, with the VA ECMO group. No, I mean, you know, in these uh, patients where ECMO has been used, it does lead to improval, but certainly there are issues with plain ECMO. So we cannot leave these patients with low ejection fraction on plain ECMO, we have to put them on a LV venting. And as you can see here, the need for unloading, as you uh, can see the bite is important because the ventricle has to be unloaded, thrombus can form, the, you know, the perfusion may not be adequate and the, e, and the, and the PA pressures and the PA wedge pressures will keep high, very, very high. So LV distension has to be avoided and here it can be done by the use of associated Impella in these patients. So the Impella was done soon after the procedure was done at the same time. So we unloaded the left ventricle and that is how we, uh, you know, and this is quite uh, now, we have done a few cases now using ECMO and Impella and led to results like these. So there are survival benefits which have been seen. And uh, the only thing in this particular case was that it was out of hospital arrest earlier, then again arrested. So that was the only limiting point. Otherwise, hemodynamics, we, we were able to sustain, we were able to do the intervention uh, from the you know the right radial axis also on the same particular day. Thank you very much, and I think uh, we'll have some time for discussion later on. Thank you. No, we I think we should discuss it right now. I think you've stuck to time very well. 
Uh, uh, Michael, uh, your comments on, on is it to, fairly often that in cardiogenic shock that you would go in with, with I mean, this was, this was a great save, but uh, so, so your comments on your uh, views on cardiogenic shock and ECMO plus impeller. Well, I think that all depends on whether the patient uh, has a, a fair um, LV function to start with. I mean, if the patient is in cardiac arrest, then there's no way we can just put in the impeller and then rescue the patient. Um, in that case, we might need to put the patient on ECMO first, as the uh, problem has shown us. And then uh, for the LV venting, we usually would add in impeller, uh, support and then during the winning phase is very useful as well because usually we will win off the uh, atmo first and then take off the impeller as the patient is getting better and better. So I think there's a, still a role for appella as shown in this case, uh, but usually for patients in uh, cardiogenic shock with a reasonable blood pressure uh, LV ejection fraction, I think an impeller would be good enough. If 2.5 is not good enough, we would usually use a CP or even upgrade to the 5.0 if really necessary. So uh, that's how we are handling cardiogenic shock uh, patients nowadays. Great, great comments. I think we could move on because we'll have some time hopefully for discussion, but I would just say that practically 2.5 is an unnecessary and perhaps uh, <laughs> uh, unworthy device in patients with cardiogenic shock or even the bad LVs who got to be supported PCS, it has to be a 3.5, uh, which will take the support. Can I ask one small question? Because, you know, we have been doing uh, ECMO first and then impeller later in these post-cardiac arrest patients. And there are some patients where I have used impeller first, like, you know, in a cardiogenic shock patient, borderline blood pressures, you do the intervention and still the blood pressure is low like in the range of about 70, 80 or so mean pressures are in the range of 55, 60. So what do you recommend? Any of you can answer this, Dr. Lee or Dr. Uh, you know, Sait or anybody, that whether you would, in what situation you would go ahead with the ECMO also in this uh, situation? Well, well, for us, uh, if it is really a pure LV dysfunction, if CP is not good enough, we would usually ask our surgeons to come in or we do a cut down to put a 5.0 in. But if there's RV involvement, because a lot of time when you are handling cardiogenic shock, RV failure is very common. Then there's an option for us because we have the impeller RP available. We can put in a RP in addition to CP. But if for like in the past, we don't have the RP, we would actually put in a, a, a ECMO as well. So appella for both LV and RV, a failure is actually a, a reasonable choice. So right. If you want to, uh, I know. I think. I think that's right. You know, you have, uh, you you have pressures less than eighty on a severe LV dysfunction, which is going to be related to severe triple vessel disease. It's better to actually or intractable arrhythmias. It's better that the patient goes on ECMO and impeller rather than impeller alone. It'll be very difficult to recover this patient uh, too rapidly on impeller, and we might lose time. So lactates rising. We just have to go less than 70 pressures. I think it's going to be ECMO followed by impeller. I think- uh, yeah, I would just add back to Dr. Lee's yeah. comments that, that the only thing I would add is what's obvious is it's critical to have the right heart cast. So Dr. Lee's yeah. comment that if it's predominantly left-sided shock, you make that determination using the left heart catheter, oh, sorry, yeah. the, the PA catheter, Swan-Gans catheter, then you can make your determination. If it's prim primarily right, Right, RV dysfunction, then um, obviously without an RP, then ECMO is a good option. With the RP, the, R, the adding the RP is a good option. So I, I think right. that that's completely correct as Dr. Lee summarized. Thank you. Okay, so let's let's move on to the next right. presentation. So the next presentation is by Dr. Siva Kumar uh, on a case of protected PCI. Dr. Siva Kumar is a senior interventional cardiologist at Pinakshi Mission Hospital, Madurai. Over to you, Dr. Siva Kumar. Yeah, thank you. Hope I'm audible. Yeah. Uh, we have seen a uh, single access PCI from Dr. Seth and Equella PCI from Praveen Chandra. I think I have shared this case earlier to Dr. Seth, uh, still uh, thought of presenting this. This was done in December 18th as a part of live case, as one of the live course by Jimmy. And this is basically a case of protected PCI involving a 77 year old female diabetic hypertensive who had earlier PCI in 2012 for a STEMI to LAD. 
and this admission presented with acute heart failure stabilized on inotropics diuretics anticoagulant and other supportive measures lv was really bad 25% rv function was normal it was a patent led with the severe osteal lcx disease with the calcium and non dominant rca this is what uh, the osteal lcx was looking like there is amount of calcium there is some osteal compromise of the led but not that bad and this is an another view showing the very critical lesion involving the lm lcx junction with the patent led and this is how the led remaining part of the stem looking on and this is the non dom so basically a kind of a, a single living conduit where the non dominant rca and non viable led and we had a discussion uh, in view of the age uh, ef and uh, anatomy uh, all that we uh, the surgeon to felt how about uh, doing this as a, a protected pci with uh, axial flow pump i think this was earlier shared when there are comorbidities and complex anatomy there are in hospital mortalities are many fold without uh, any kind of useful hemodynamic device like this i think this was also again shared by the very first speaker this we have seen earlier so protected pca is a one when there is a complex anatomy comorbidities a kind of a my case where non dominant rc a non viable lady with a single living conduit that too calcified Uh, a nodule like sitting at the lm lcx junction where um, without an a protective device definitely this is what it is when you do these kind of a cases without a hemodynamic support there is a progressive fall in uh, aortic pressure and you may not be comfortably complete the procedure or any, even if you complete the procedure you may have a post operative complications but wherein when the impella is on uh, there is still when you interfere with the heart function there is still aortic pressure is maintained to you complete the procedure this is a, this is a famous slide from sky that when you do this as an upfront device as an elective uh, device rather than as a bailout device definitely there is a, a great improvement uh, with the outcome which is tenfold just moving on to my case back uh, this was elective so we went ahead with the two proglides and uh, the insertion step was done once it was properly in and properly positioned uh, we did a, um, a pre pci assessment of the lesion with an ivs just wanted to know uh, whether it is trackable uh, what is a, a type of calcium it was of course nodular calcium but occupying more than two quadrants so considering the side branch which is even though non viable but we don't want to lose this so we thought uh, we will uh, non atherectomy based preparation will do it was IVL 3.512 uh, could do. Uh, uh, this is this is a, this is the basic reason I wanted to present this case. When we did this ballooning of this critical site um, in a non-dominant RC with a non-viable, very bad LV, when at particular point when LV pressure was totally out, uh, still the arterial pressure was maintained, so-called ventricular arterial un uncoupling, which we can see here classically when. we were ballooning that critical site and when the lv pressure was gone still the mean arterial aortic pressure was maintained both systolic and diastolic and map and once we were relieved of the pain, uh, balloon when the own native heart heart started coming up then we started appreciating this uh, ventricular arterial coupling so basically ventricular arterial coupling uncoupling and recoupling this was very classically appreciated that's the reason why i thought i will present this so of course uh, coming back to the case um, following ivs assessment and initial preparation with ivl we did an oct assessment just to know what is the impact over the nodule which showed at the lad it was a branch point to coronal tip was a little shorter we were worried um, opposite to the nodule the lad may uh, get compressed but the angle was not that bad but still if it is less than 50 and it showed in one of the still images around 12 o'clock some cracks uh, but not exactly on the nodular side so we thought we will prepare further with the scoring balloon which was 3.5 to 12 this time and again we did a pull back the scoring balloon showed some luminal gain of course it was not a circular uh, elliptical luminal gain no great impact on the nodule but it has 
uh, really made some impact uh, in the other areas of uh, vessel so that we thought uh, we can drop in a stand it was now 3.5 in the 28 you can see now the impella is really properly uh, in place we were uh, keep on adjusting uh, it was making vigorous movements then uh, post dilated and when we did a post tending oct of course well opposed uh, well expanded of course it was an asymmetrical expansion that was the debate between atherectomy versus non-atherectomy uh, kind of a preparation where obviously in an atherectomy base there is a volume reduction and uh, it is not only expand it expands well it expands in a more uh, appreciable manner that is so called cylindrical whereas in a non atherectomy based you get this kind of uh, asymmetrical expansion so to conclude just wanted to share this uh, simple uh, typical real world case of high risk pci where the vessel was single living conduit with a very bad lv uh, we had a complex anatomy like nodule uh, image assisted all that stuff really this axial flow form helped that helped us to do all that and wanted to demonstrate that ventricular arterial uncoupling and recoupling happening during my case. Thank you, Anadol. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Seth, uh, do you have any comments? Seth? So, uh, no, oh, Seth. I, I'm sorry. I don't know. I don't, I don't, I thought it was wonderful uh, demonstration. So, no, I have, I have nothing to add. So, thank you for asking. Right. Yeah, so asking that, uh, you know, there was a, Jamie McCabe gave a good uh, recommendation about, you know, how to, when to use uh, Impella in, in protected PCI. And I'm, I'm, I know that Dr. Shok said was preparing uh, a similar algorithm for uh, our Indian patients also, you know, the, the thing that fits in our uh, scenario. So uh, do you use, uh, uh, how, when to use uh, support in these patients or not? So very, very relevant question. Are you asking that to, to Shivkumar or, or? Just or, a general discussion point. Yeah, general discussion point. So, so Michael, your comments on our practice, when should you be using Impella? I mean, it's just for, was this in general? I mean, I think this was case very well done. It actually showed the fact that you could block the left vein. Now, if this patient had a normal LV, would you use Impella? If the patient had, I, I what think, level would you start using Impella? And that's probably, you know, the, 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 that's going to be, you know, there's going to be a great interest around Protect4 exactly on those patients you could do without Impella versus you could do without, with Impella looking at long-term uh, long outcomes. Right. I think uh, it all depends on uh, how we define high-risk PCI. So for us, uh, if there's any uh, uh, is severely or mod even moderately impaired LV function, when there is a, a like severe triple vessel disease that we would anticipate the use of arthrectomy devices because a lot of time when you use these arthrectomy devices, you will end up with a lot of no reflow, slow flow phenomenon, then the impeller might be very, uh, very helpful. Or when we are doing like single remaining vessel, single conduit, then you know the risk will be much, much higher. So all, in all these sort of clinical scenarios, uh, even though the LV function might be normal, we would actually highly recommend uh, uh, putting in a support first uh, for us to do high risk PCI. So really, uh, there are really uh, uh, cheap cases like in this case. Okay, just just a comment that I have is that this patient had an LED which was infarcted, so certainly had decreased LV ejection fraction. I'm not sure whether he had high PA pressures or not, but that would be another reason to go in. And if his PA oxygen saturations were low. And that would be the third reason. But this is the sort of case who then would be getting randomized, I'm sure, in the protect four. Say, and, and perhaps you'd actually do a better job if you actually was a complex lesion, it was calcified, it needed imaging, it needed optimization. That's what's going to actually show in the in the protect four that you actually had better optimization and perhaps longevity on a longer term basis if you actually did it on impella rather than just put a stent in, get out, did not, you know, could not modify the plaque did not get optimization. You got away with it. You had a patient out of the lab alive. You went, when he went home, but he may not actually do so well in the longer term if had you done him on Impella versus without Impella. Is that right, Seth? I, I agree completely, yes. So I think that that is the strong message that I, I think it's wonderful that every presenter has said so far is, is that there's no, there's no, this is not a suggestion that 
anybody needs Impella to get somebody out of a procedure or even out of the hospital alive. It's optimizing outcomes. We've seen this, um, you know, in the U.S. and in Europe, and I, and I know in India there still is a fair amount of off-pump cabbage versus on-pump cabbage. But we even see this in the cabbage literature that you can get people out of the hospital quicker with off-pump cabbage, but their survival and their graft patency is greater at one year on-pump. And so we're using that as an analogy to help interventionists think about optimizing outcomes by doing all the things that you described, maximizing luminal dimension, doing imaging, best practices for bifurcations. All we, we know people can do those things, but can you do them in an impaired ventricle and will the ventricle tolerate it and allow the patient to recover more completely? So that's really that what's being um, uh, um, uh, evaluated in protect form, we believe, while we wait for those results, that there's copious evidence that, that that's the right way to go now. Thank you for those comments. Thank you, thank you. We could move on, Vishal. So uh, I don't see Ravinder Singh Rao here. Is he here? Because the next presentation is by Ravinder Rao. Uh, I don't see him here. So all right, we move on to Dr. Sharath Reddy, who's going to present uh, a case of protected high-risk PCI with impella and severe airway dysfunction patients with the left main coronary artery disease and triple vessel disease involving RCA. Uh, Dr. Sharath Reddy is interventional cardiologist at Medicover Hospital, Hyderabad. Over to you, Dr. Reddy. Thank you, uh, Dr. Rastogi and uh, <clears throat> Translumina for inviting me uh, to present this case of protected PCI in a patient with severe LV dysfunction and LMCA with triple vessel disease. So my patient is a 49-year-old gentleman uh, with a stage 5 kidney disease, underwent trans renal transplant in 2002 and was on immunosuppressive therapy. And uh, uh, quite recently in the last three years, he had recurrent admissions with the decompensated LV failure with recurrent unstable anginas. So for which angiogram was done in 2018 showing us two as well disease, but advised on medical management. But subsequently his episodes of uh, admission, heart failure admissions increased and also his graft failed for a period of time. So now he came for a you know, second renal transplant to us. So this was his ECG showing a normal R wave everywhere. And this was his echo showing severe LV dysfunction, but preserved thickness of myocardium all over, but, uh, and also normal aortic valve and no mitral regurgitation or no LV clot. So we did a viability scan, which showed the viable segments in all areas. And this is the angiogram, which we have done recently, two months back. So RCA is uh, totally occluded, uh, dominant, and uh, left system, there is a significant LMCA disease, as well as proximal LAD disease, and also total occlusion of left circumflex and diffuse disease. So <clears throat> with this anatomy, the critical challenges being you know, patient desperate for second renal transplant, severe LV systolic dysfunction with increased pulmonary pressure and also LMCA and triple vessel disease uh, with a dominant RCA CTO. So we looked into both these iliofemorals, which were fine. So, and we had a discussion about uh, PCA followed by renal transplant after three to six months and CABG followed by transplant after one to three months. But as a patient, not willing for CABG, we had to move on with PCI. Uh, these are the challenges in PCI, which already I discussed. And obviously this patient score is more than four with high syntax score and planned revascularizations more than two territories and retro many retrograde for RCS, CTO and high LV EDP pressure. Mm -hmm. So we decided to go ahead with uh, uh, hemodynamic support and when we saw his uh, uh, PCWP, it was more than 25. And uh, we took uh, Impella CP uh, support. So we went through uh, right femoral axis as his left femoral uh, axis, uh, left internal iliac artery is uh, due for uh, end to uh, end to end anastomosis for his renal transplant. So um, yeah, we took right femoral axis and then we crossed uh, aortic valve and then exchanged to O18 wire and then placed impella. 
Yeah. So, and uh, once uh, position is confirmed by pressures as well as uh, imaging, we started impella onto auto mode. So post that we started our procedure with the left system and uh, yeah, the, we placed a microcatheter dis proximal to total occlusion. There was a micro channel. So we took a micro channel tracking wire, filter XTR, we crossed the lesion and then we dilated with 1.5 mm balloon and this was post balloon. So there is a diffuse disease extending from Austral LCX down into all three OMs. So at this stage, we did IVS from all OMs and we, to understand stunting strategy as the ostiums of both OM2 and OM3 uh, MLAs were same and block area is same, uh, but the distal vessel is quite good with the OM2. We decided to stunt into OM2. This was the first stunt which we placed into OM2. And then we dilated OM1 uh, just as a provisional uh, uh, stunting strategy. And then we dilated LMCA. The moment we dilated LMCA, patient developed almost slow flow. And uh, we can see this was the aortic pressure before, and this is what happened. So uh, as Dr. Shivakumar showed, there is a complete uncoupling leading to loss of pulsatility of uh, pressure. So, but still mean arterial pressure was maintained. So at this stage, we had to switch our strategy. Originally we planned DKs for this patient, but I quickly switched to uh, mini crush and placed uh, three into 38 into LCX and 3.5 into 18 into LMCA to LED. And we deployed, so we deployed stunts. Uh, yeah, we deployed stunts. And then we did kissing and uh, followed by uh, uh, pot for kissing and followed by, you know, repot. So once that is done, then we address the mid LED lesion with a 2.75 and 38 millimeter stunt. So this was the result we have got. So post this, uh, we had to switch to RCS CTO. This is where I need a second access. And uh, this is where I used uh, the technique which Dr. Uh, Seth has explained in his first presentation that is ship technique. We took a um, seven French sheet. It's a cook sheet, which I placed through the uh, impella sheet. And then uh, it's a uh, 30 centimeter sheet, which was pushed out of uh, uh, you know, proximal opening of impella sheet. And then we exchanged uh, our left guide and then went ahead with, this is how it is done. So went ahead with the uh, RCS CTO, but uh, I couldn't place my integrated guide into RCS due to abnormal origin. At this stage, I directly switched to retrograde, thinking to uh, uh, thinking of uh, uh, snaring integrated wire in out and uh, completing procedure. So we crossed a retrograde without much difficulty. Yeah, so, and uh, yeah, uh, after the wire reached uh, distal cap, uh, we uh, did an integrate, I mean, retrograde wire escalation. The wire ended up in subintima. So, and despite uh, repeated uh, different curves, I couldn't engage right coronary artery integratedly. And the impella was actually interfering with my uh, catheter manipulation in the aorta. So that's when, mm, as the procedure time was went beyond four and a half hours, I had two options here. One is rem remove impella and then get an integrated axis. The other is uh, just do a retrograde knuckle and send the knuckle into uh, iota and snare it and complete the procedure. But looking, uh, thinking of uh, long stunt and subintimal stunt where patient has to undergo renal transplant in the next three months, so we opted out of doing that uh, knuckling. And uh, see, uh, then we took a final injections after doing a report in LMCA and optimizing a lady stunt. So this is the final result in left system. And that's where we left. These are the areas with intravascular ultrasound, proximal LED 9.2 mm square and osteal 10 mm square, LMCA 13 mm square and uh, uh, Austral LCX 6 mm square. So, and then uh, we slowly 
step down in Bell flow and uh, subsequently we uh, pulled it into IAT and switched off and removed impella on table. So this is the post uh, uh, removal angiogram showing no vascular complications. So many patients with poor LV function and uh, coronary artery disease with challenging anatomy need revascularization, but not offered or attempted due to high risk nature of procedure. Protected PCI with impella can be offered to all such patients for stable intraprocedural hemodynamics, which allows operator to do um, uh, optimization of intervention uh, uh, easily. And single access high risk PCI uh, technique can also be used in uh, suitable patients uh, or patients like mine, where it can be used as a second access, either for anti-grade or retrograde access. Thank you. Great case, Dr. Sharath. Uh, very well done. Any comments, Dr. Said? Yeah, so, so Sharath, great case. Uh, but, but, uh, and, and I think you, know, you, you were tremendous. You sort of did the left, and because you had the impeller support, you were able to do retrograde and, and actually succeeded, I would say, had it been <clears throat> natural circumstances. Two comments. First, most importantly, in the days of virtual, virtual lectures and, and virtual meetings, it's great to have your slides with one image per case, uh, one, one, one image per slide, one run per slide. Because when you have four runs, believe you me, on everybody's computer, those runs become minuscule to actually see. And those are the things that we learn out of the present ways of uh, having meetings and our present ways of uh, transferring knowledge. So please, those, that was tremendous, except that we couldn't see many of those images because there were four images on a single slide. <laughs> the, the second aspect of, of everything is that uh, you, you, know, you use a cook sheet, you realize that when you put, put, pushed it in, you would have friction because it's not hydrophilic. So that was the first aspect. The longer sheet you have, the better it is because it's less interaction. And, and in your case, um, if that sheath was the one, if, if that guide was the one that you had through the impeller CP sheath and were maneuvering and it was the RCA guide, then you would have a, had a lot of problems in maneuvering, in torquing, in terms of positioning it. And therefore that one would have been best for giving you, retrograde, uh, giving you the retrograde injections so that you just park it there and don't move it. So that would have been best for the left system it could have been a diagnostic, it could have been a guiding catheter, but you would have had to use an alternative access, which is either the other side femoral or radial for doing your procedure, which would have been the best. I've realized that it's not great to maneuver too many guides through a single access impeller side by experience, I know that. So it's, it's best to have that for you know, stable positions rather than too much of manipulations. Dr. Said, can I ask you a question, sir? I'm Dr. Hajra here. Yeah. What is the current status of transcaval, uh, this ECMO and uh, Impella? And I am no, I'm sure you'll be the first person to implement this thing to our juniors. Uh, so, is it is it brewing in your mind? The, so, so both, I mean, this is a big area of discussion. Maybe Seth can actually say just, you know, a couple of minutes on alternative accesses, which is, by the way, the commonest alternative access is the subclavian, which is clearly one of the most favored accesses on a long-term impeller basis because it's, it's actually used frequently. And I would also go to say, yes, those who are experts at transcable have done it as an emergency in those who've got no other access, but it's not the first or preferred access if you have accesses in the subclavian, if you have got no femoral access, the next alternative access, which is usually clean, which is usually good, which is easily accessible through a 14 French. And in future, by the way, we won't be discussing all this because the nine French impeller would be here. So we won't be discussing all this, but for present discussions, Seth, over to you for, for people who have that experience. Yes, a little to add. The only thing I guess I will add, Dr. Seth, to your comments was that the 
axillary access can only be used for the CP. It can't be used for something larger. It's right. Even very experienced operators can't put in something larger than the 14 French percutaneously. Mm -hmm. Certainly we use the surgical cut downs for the Impella 5.0 and 5.5. Right. So if there's a need for, trans for emergency use, uh, there's a growing experience. Uh, 10 patient experience from Henry Ford Hospital with Drs. O'Neill and Letterman yeah. have been published already. And now, now in press is their next 100 patients. So there is a growing experience at a few select centers, but it's not for the faint of heart to do it in the setting of shock without prior imaging, but it is certainly an option. So I agree completely. Axillary is the, is a, is the, is the, I would think the number two best option. And I think for most interventionalists, that's a skill that can be learned. It still has to be done cautiously and with uh, some mentoring and, and, and proctoring, but, but I would agree with your comments otherwise. Thank you, Dr. Hazra. In fact, axillary has been preferred option by many operators for even situations where they believe that they would leave impella for quite some time. So this could be cardiogenic shock patients. It's easy access, it's, it's, it's favorable. And as the patient can get better, they can actually have mobility of their lower limbs, which is a very important aspect. People can mobilize on impeller, so that's a long-term uh, impeller support. And the final access is at, at the CHIP CTO 2021, Apple Greenbaum showed some tremendous cases of bailout using, using transcable approach of impeller. But he's so good at, at doing it that he can use it even as an emergency procedure, but most individuals can't. I think this, this discussion will actually go away with the lower profile impellers, which are about to come through. And I, we won't be discussing too much of alternative accesses with the nine French devices on the horizon. Very close by, by the way. Thank you. So there's one question from the audience, which says that, uh, uh, can you upfront use intraiotic balloon pop in such patients rather so, than going for impella? So I think the, the operator should answer that. <laughs> Yeah, in, in my patient, uh, when I started dilating uh, LMCA, so there is a clear um, no-flow phenomena. And had I kept only IABP, IABP hardly provides 500 ml of you know, stroke volume, but there is no LV. Uh, I mean, that LV unloading is not sufficient enough. So uh, I, I really don't believe that uh, maintenance coronary perfusion at that five minutes, because that is going to be crucial uh, otherwise, uh, um, the entire uh, procedure will turn into a different angle. I have to move on to CPR, and you know, my I had to, uh, I had to ha halt my procedure and move to CPR, which really changes the outcome of patient. So, because the impella was there, and that next six minutes, the uh, current perfusion is maintained, and I could complete, I could switch my strategy and rapidly completed with the mini crest technique and uh, re, uh, got the flow back and then I could complete you know, rest of the procedure. I, I, I don't really believe IABP would have made a big difference in this particular case. 100% agree with you, sir. It wouldn't have supported your complications. And, and you know, when I showed my case with multiple complications in a guy who was PA pressures of uh, 60 and an EF of 30, not, uh, 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 IABP doesn't support that. So it doesn't bail you out when you really need it. Uh, so let's move, move on. Uh, uh, Vishal, any other questions from the audience? Because that should be addressed by our experts around the table. Any other questions were there? Uh, we'll keep on uh, taking Thank them you. if it comes. Please. So uh, we now uh, invite uh, uh, Dr. Michael Lee to give his uh, presentation on importance of program-based approach and practices in managing cardiogenic shock, uh, the uh, Queen Elizabeth Hospital experience. Okay, uh, thank you. You hear me well? You can see well? Great. Um, thank you for the uh, invitation. Um, it's a pleasure for me to uh, share with you our experience in this sort of a step by step approach uh, in using uh, the impeller device in, uh, in the setting of cardiogenic shock. Uh, we, we, we know that even 10, 20 years ago, that uh, AMI complicating cardiogenic shock has very, very high in hospital mortality. This about 50% uh, survival rate has been there since the year 2000. And uh, believe me or not, it is almost the same up to the year 2017. So even three, four years ago, they have still a very high mortality for patients presenting with cardiogenic shock. 
it is this national uh, cardiogenic shock initiative that actually has changed the game. What they are doing has actually provide a, a survival rate of more than 70% and with more than 90% native heart recovery. What they have done is, uh, as mentioned by Sid before, that they have a sort of a very a well-designed algorithm. The, they first identify the shock early and then they will activate the cath lab. And then they, instead of going for immediate PCI, they will assess the patient whether there is uh, any uh, LV dysfunction, LV uh, failure, RV failure, either by cat or by uh, echo. And then they decide on whether they need to put in the support before uh, PCI. So they stress very much on this door to support time uh, and the target is less than 90 minutes. And then uh, they would perform PCI. Uh, and then up, even after the PCI, they would uh, look at the right heart cat uh, results again and then adjust uh, the uh, of, uh, uh, upgrading or even winning of this uh, inotropic support or even the uh, uh, mechanical support uh, according to this uh, cardiac power output as well as the PEP score in which they need to um, whether they need to uh, provide uh, further RV support as well. Uh, the uh, cardiogenic short onset time to the impeller support time is very very important. You can see that with a few hours delay, uh, 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 the mortality can actually be increased a uh, double fold. So it is very important to stress the, that um, uh, the shortest the uh, uh, onset of cardiogenic shock to impeller time, the better the survival of the patients. And um, uh, as I mentioned before, so before the year 2017, you can see no matter what you do with the uh, ATMO, with uh, IBP, the um, uh, survival rate for this uh, sort of cardiogenic shock patients are still in the 50s. But with this best practice protocols, you can see that it actually can achieve more than 70% uh, of survival, um, which uh, include uh, early identification of shock and then uh, if not needed, we can actually down titrate the uh, anotropic agents. And then uh, uh, if not enough LV support, we escalate. And then we look at the cat finding, uh, look for LV dysfunction as well, and then add accordingly. Um, actually, the Japanese has also reproduced similar results um, according to this best practice protocols. Um, they actually report, uh, again, more than 70% survival overall by uh, in their cardiogenic shock patients, 77% uh, in patients presented with AMI cardiogenic shock, and even better results for patients presented with myocarditis cardiogenic shock. So it is something that we should bear in mind and we should uh, try to use it as uh, uh, much as we can, these uh, best practice protocols. So if you look at the Detroit data uh, in more detail, uh, in their in the beginning of their uh, program, you see this survival rate of 72%, not, not bad. But if you compare uh, the uh, later results, when they uh, actually embark uh, on the national CSI registry, and uh, when they actually use more of this impeller before PCI, and then uh, they perform more uh, right heart cath at the end of the procedure, or even at the beginning of the procedure, actually they have an even better survival rate of 88%. So obviously when we use this uh, uh, protocol driven best practice protocols, we actually can achieve a much, much better results. Uh, for us, we actually started our uh, impeller program back in 2015, but we started it very slowly. It's one, one reason is the cost and the other reason is the expertise. So what we have done is we used uh, two, three years to start with high-risk PCI first. When we uh, have been accustomed to the use of impeller, then we start to use it in uh, patients uh, in cardiogenic shock. And uh, the first cardiogenic shock patients that we use uh, impeller is back uh, in 2018. Um, so after, afterward, you see this uh, rapid increase in the use of uh, impeller, both in terms of high-risk PCI as well as cardiogenic shock patients. So in this year, for the first five months, 
we have actually have done uh, ten high risk PCI, supported PCI, and then uh, I think about twelve to fifteen patients with uh, AMI cardiogenic shock. So altogether, for protected PCI, we've done um, sixty six cases since two thousand and fifteen. A majority of these patients, 94% of them, actually we can win off the impeller on table. We don't need to bring it out to our CCU. Uh, the one year uh, cardiovascular mortality uh, uh, is around 12%. Uh, quite a reasonable result, I, I would say. Well, when we engage ourselves in uh, cardiogenic shock, actually we set up this protocol. So we think protocol treatment is very, very important. So. What we are looking at is first identification of cardiogenic shock. And then uh, rapidly, we would, uh, if, if time allows, we will put in a Swan Gans catheter to look at the hemodynamics and then help us decide whether we would need this mechanical support uh, before we start a coronary intervention. And then with this support, we can actually go ahead to do uh, uh, PCI for these AMI patients. And then uh, at the end of the procedure, we will look at the cardiac output, uh, cardiac power output again, as well as this PEP score, and then guide us through whether we need to upgrade the uh, impeller support, or even we need to put in the uh, impeller LP or ECMO support for RV dysfunction. Or on the other hand, if we can actually win off the anotropes as quickly as possible, or even uh, help us to win down the mechanical support devices in the uh, CCU. So for our cardiogenic shock program, we started it uh, in 2018. So far, we've done 66 cases. Our average days uh, of uh, the patients on impeller is about four days. Uh, the win off rate is very high. I would say uh, two thirds of these patients we can win off the uh, impeller. But as you can see, this is a mixed group of patients, mixed group of cardiologists. Uh, some of us are not accustomed to our protocol uh, yet. And uh, I can tell you that it is not that easy for everyone to get uh, 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 agree on the protocol to start putting in the mechanical support devices before you open up the vessel. So some cardiologists are still believing uh, the door to balloon type. So they still want to open up the vessel when they encounter problem, they will put in the impeller. But if you follow our protocol, we actually advise putting in a mechanical support device first before we actually embark on the, the PCI procedure for patients really come in with cardiogenic shock. So I would say we are not there yet. Our seven day survival, although it's about 76%, our 30 day survival is still a little short of 70%, 65% overall. But we are actually committed to achieve this more than 70% 30 day survival. And I think with our protocol, uh, we can do it in the very, very uh, near future. So to sum up, we actually adopted a, a, problem, a programmatic approach to start up our mechanical uh, circuit, circulatory support uh, program. We started with a protected PCI and then moved on to cardiogenic shock. We actually also use this uh, protocol-driven uh, approach uh, for patients in cardiogenic shock. So we identify and support this patient early, and then if uh, we can win down the anotropes at the end of the procedure, we will win it down. If we, uh, the support is not enough, we will escalate according to the cardiac power output, and then we will use a right heart cap to identify right heart dysfunction and act accordingly whether we need to put in an impeller LP or even an uh, ECMO uh, device. Uh, so that's all uh, I want to share, and thank you very much for your attention. This is a uh, great insight to the program, uh, Dr. Lee, and we are all striving to reach there. Uh, but of course, uh, one question every time comes here in India is the cost, so the, the device is expensive, and a lot of uh, mm, so a lot of uh, audience is also asking about you know the cost and the, uh, the issues related to that part. Right. Uh, well, firstly, uh, firstly, Michael, I must tell you, Vishal is one of the one of the finest and very experienced mechanical circulatory support uh, expert uh, in the country. He says he's uh, uh, I'm, I'm you know we're very proud of uh, 
how he's taken this all. And he's been training a lot of people on Impella across the country. So I'm, I'm sure he's asked you that question because he can answer much of that himself, <laughs> but he's asked you that question. I think the first job is to convince your government. That's what we have done. So we, we actually uh, show our government our protected PCI results. We tell them, see, this is doable. So even with uh, in patients uh, uh, with stable condition, only high risk PCI, when we uh, use this mechanical device, we can actually protect the patient. We can achieve a very good results. And then we show them the mortality of these cardiogenic shock patients and the improvement that we can uh, achieve with the use of this uh, device. So now in Hong Kong, we are fortunate enough to be supported by the government. So whenever we say the patient is in cardiogenic shock, we can actually put in the impeller device uh, anytime, even in the middle of the night, and it's fully supported by the government. So they have special funding for us to do this uh, high, high risk uh, uh, PCIs in patients with cardiogenic shock. So I think that's very important. It's very hard to ask the patient to put, to pay for this device before you start uh, PCI for cardiogenic shock. So uh, I think that's uh, Michael, I'll, I'll just, just comment yes. briefly. You know, one of, this has been one of the, the roadblocks for our country where in cardiogenic shock, you can't ask patient to upfront pay for that device, yes. which is very expensive out here. And our country will not reimburse it at all for many years, primarily because it's taken them ages to even think about reimbursing tower valve at a very low cost, irrespective of anything, whatever we demonstrate to them. And sec thirdly, that is where the delay comes in. When the patient deteriorates to a point of death, that's when people start agreeing to say, please save him, do anything. And then that, that amount of money is acceptable. But, but the, by that time, the situation is too far gone. Yes. Yes. And therefore, the time they accept is when they're going to not survive. Unfortunately, if we do it up front and early and the patient doesn't survive, then we'll be left with a bill on the hospital, which nobody will pay for. Mm -hmm. And that's a clear situation which happens in the country. Even, in a, even let me just comment for the elective, uh, elective impellers. Yes, we do take, it, take them out in the cath lab, but can you believe it that on occasions we've actually not taken it out in the cath lab because in a tower when they pay heavily, they know that something's been implanted. If they pay heavily at the same cost for an impeller device, which they never see, which you say, I took it out in the, in the cath lab, <laughs> they may trust me that I've put that device in, but I would have to, many, many, many centers would have actually to show them that they really put it in. Yeah. And so it's better to leave them with the device that they come out and take it out after four hours so that the patient feels that he did have that support device, which was so expensive. And he had it for a few hours rather than for just a few, few minutes. So that is the, the, the problem of self-pay in a country where people pay out of their bank accounts. Dr. Lee. I, 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 uh, I, I would like if I could just make a brief comment to Dr. Seth's comment about leaving the device in. And separate from the, the comments that were made about ensuring that the confidence that the device was used, we are seeing a growing trend towards longer utilization. Dr. Lee suggests that his use outside the cath lab is only about 5%, but it was 17% in the PROTECT3 data presented at TCT. So a little higher than what, what Dr. Lee showed. And we saw a trend from PROTECT2 to PROTECT3. And I think what's happening is more and more patients with severe LV dysfunction are going about really prolonged procedures, like many of the cases shown today, three hours of ischemic time with lots of procedures. The heart needs a little more time to recover. So, so I would urge everyone to consider lowering the barrier or lowering the hurdle to uh, give a patient a little longer support, whether it's three or four hours or overnight, it can make an enormous benefit in recovering the heart and avoid the need to support the patients with pressors and other things. Not in all patients, still a minority, but as I said, 17% in PROTECT3, uh, much higher than what we saw in PROTECT2. So I think that's a trend um, in, that we're seeing that in these very sick hearts. I, I would augment that. I mean, I'm not just going to take one minute in the interest of time, but I want to emphasize that really important point. It may not, may not be even for 24 hours, it could be 48 hours. For example, the case which I had, and you actually 
do extensive revascularization. You blow up the balloon multiple times. You have complications, you have slow flow. You actually optimize, you, you don't realize how much you bugger up that LV, which is already impaired. And you've got support, so you think this is great. Believe you me, I've had situations where I had four hours of a procedure. I kept it for 24 hours. The patient looked good, but I had had a four and a half hours procedure with multiple rotational atherectomy, multiple balloon dilatations, loss of a few branches, but the patient was doing fine. I took it out of 24 hours. Soon after I took it out, the patient deteriorated. By 48 hours, he was had severe lactic acidosis and died. I would buggered up his LV. I should have kept it for three to four days. I would have actually recovered that LV which I had buggered up, I had actually had, 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 had uh, uh, stunned it beyond what it was already there. So I think it's so important to understand what uh, Seth said. It's, it's important to understand that complex and prolonged procedures with multiple, multiple uh, plaque modifications and multiple inflations and optimization is going to extend that stunning into a further LV dysfunction and yet the patient is an impella and looks good, but it's not going to be good when you take out the impella. Thank Michelle, you. Can I make a uh, ask a question to Dr. Lee? Sure. Dr. Lee, how much permissible time you have for the DTU concept in our country? Uh, you know, DTU is basically you do the angiogram, put him on impella in STEMI situation before putting anything in the coronary. That is number one. And number two, do you think the supersaturated oxygen intracoronary cooling Ultra filters and etc. will change the outcome in your country. Um, I have I don't have any experience on the cooling uh, uh, of the coronary, but uh, when patients are having uh, like a cardiac arrest, we cool the patient. That that's okay for us, but we don't have experience of like uh, cooling in the coronary uh, arteries. Uh, my point of the door to uh, support time is not really to um, anything delay uh, uh, further the door to balloon time. We will try to open the vessel as uh, soon as possible as well. But for those patients who are really in cardiogenic shock, the first thing you can see actually uh, is to support the patient. If, if it's actually, uh, when you do a lot more uh, the, uh, putting in the impeller device, it's actually very quick to put in the impeller device. Maybe five, 10 minutes for, for our team to put in the impeller device. So five to 10 minutes delay uh, as compared to the usual door to balloon time uh, is actually uh, negligible, I would say, when you can actually support the procedure during the intervention. Otherwise, you open up the vessel, you come, uh, you, you run into uh, a severe uh, cardiogenic shock and then patient further uh, having further uh, uh, lactic acidosis and then the vicious cycle will just spiral down. And you can never rescue the patient, even when you know you have to put in some device and then you put in the device at the end of the procedure. It's totally different. Thank that's you. how we learn. And that's why our data, as you can see, we are not there yet, not 70% yet, because some of our operators are still open up the vessel first and then put in the impeller device afterwards. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Now we move on to the next presentation, which is by Dr. Anand Rao, who is a senior interventional cardiologist at Holy Family Hospital, Mumbai. And he'll be talking about went home young at 92. Uh, thank you, Dr. Seth, Dr. Astogi, uh, and thanks to me for having you here. So let me go to the history directly. These are the, my patient details. She's 92 year old female. Apparently quite active uh, at home. She's very independent, non-diabetic, non-hypertensive. Presented with chest pain on exertion and multiple episodes of LBF in last one month. So she's been getting admitted in last one month uh, three times. And then uh, the LV has progressively gone down, which was 45% to begin with. Now it's become 25% and now creatinine normal. So we took her up for angio and... Uh, this was the situation. She had a she had a calcified uh, left main, and this is Medina one one one. The circumflex uh, ostium is also quite severely calcified. If you look at the LED, is severely narrowed. The left main is diseased, and uh, if you look at the uh, branches and the distal vessel, they look quite okay. Uh, if you look at the LED, it's quite nice, and uh, there's enough landing zone before the diagonal. So 
mid part. Uh, uh, there is some region in the mid part, so we thought we'll assess that also. Her uh, RCA was uh, non-dominant and it was uh, it was diffuse disease. So the syntax score was more than 35. First choice was uh, cabbage. Second choice was a chip with impella support. Heart team was consulted, patient and relatives uh, considering the age and uh, various other issues. They said that they'll go ahead with the PCI with associated risk with impella uh, support. High risk uh, consent was obtained. So uh, impella, uh, this was the left groin uh, we accessed uh, within the micropuncture and then uh, the left femoral artery was uh, punctured, and then this was the uh, sheet uh, which was getting dilated. Once uh, that was done, we thought everything is fine, but then the sheet could not go above the iliac. There was a big chunk of uh, calcium, as you can see here. There's a big chunk of calcium which is sort of uh, uh, pushing it. We had difficulty in, uh, in the sheet going in, and the impeller sheet which comes with the, the short sheet. Uh, put in French, uh, you know, the, the, the device the device could not uh, go up. Now the choice was whether uh, we have to do a balloon uh, plasty or do an IVL at the iliac and uh, get the impella inside. So uh, fortunately we had the uh, long sheath and then uh, we took the long sheath and we slowly started negotiating the impella somehow, somehow for our luck. Uh, the impella uh, went in. Actually, the sheath could not go above the, uh, above the bifurcation. However, we could, with gentle manipulation, the impella uh, device could go in. So this was the first hurdle we faced. Then, as you can see, uh, it traveled well over that over one, uh, one eight wire, and then we could uh, get the impella into the position, and it started uh, working well. Now straight away we thought uh, I, my plan was to rota both the lesion. There is no point of uh, doing imaging because these are very very tight lesions. So I took a, a rota floppy wire in the LED, uh, took a 1.5 burr at uh, 180,000 uh, revolutions per minute, uh, did the burring because there was a situation of a mid segment lesion which was seen in uh, some views. So we thought uh, let me burr that also. So the entire LED was burred. And this was uh, some shoot we took after the bury. Before that, as you can see, we put a pacemaker also, temporary pacemaker over there. Then I uh, put in the wire into the circumflex and did a very small pecking motions into uh, the circumflex osteum. My burr was getting stalled uh, over here in the circumflex osteum. I was doing very, very gentle motion so that we could pass through it and if you can see my right panel, I'm doing a lot of pecking movements and I got a, a very good smooth uh, polishing run at the end of uh, the situation. So uh, the lesion uh, was uh, yielded quite well. And as you can see, uh, there is some distraction which is there in the mid segment. At this point also, I was not ready to image. I thought, let me go ahead first fix this vessels. So this was a pre-dilatation 2.5 NC balloon. Now uh, all the balloons and everything was working very smoothly. 2.515 NC balloon at high pressures, 80 to 20 atmospheres, and then uh, did the uh, LAD and L LAD and LCA, LMCA pre dilatation with the same balloon. Since the angle was uh, uh, very good, I thought you know my strategy was not to go, go into any crush technique. So I thought let me uh, the angle was more than 90 degrees. So tap uh, was my uh, technique of choice over here. So we, I had. Uh, Good landing zone for the side. So, fix the uh, mid LED uh, lesion 2.75 by 33, kept the stent away from the sir costume. I don't want any uh, <clears throat> double layer uh, this thing in front of sir. So, took a shorter stent, deployed that. Then, uh, took a 3.5 by 23 zines and uh, uh, this was deployed at uh, 12 atmospheres, carefully overlapping each other. Then uh, optimize optimize the stent with the uh, 3O NC balloon in the distal segment, and then uh, 3.5 over here did did a pot with the 4 by 8 uh, NC balloon. After doing the pot, I recrossed the uh, circumflex. 
then uh, pre dilated the circumflex initially with a small balloon, then took a bigger balloon and pre dilated it very well. Then this was the strength 3 by 12 of science expedition LCX uh, tap technique. And after this, kissing balloon, if you, can, if you can see even the LED waste, there was small waste in spite of the strength over there. So that was, that was done. And uh, this was the final kissing uh, inflation. And then uh, did a report with the 4.5, six millimeter balloon, and skip balloon keeping uh, a bit outside. And we had a fantastic result done. So now I did the OCT uh, run from the LED. And uh, you can see the OCT run, the distal uh, part of the strength, uh, there was no dissection. The luminal areas were very good. And if you look at the um, expansion was quite good, almost 87% expansion in the mid segment in the LED. Then uh, LED ostium, uh, the area was seven and a half uh, square millimeter, mean diameters of uh, three. And uh, if you look at the uh, LMCA, we have a, a minimal luminal area of almost 13 square millimeters. And uh, there was a single layer Neo Carena, which was uh, very well uh, demonstrated over here, which uh, we saw. And then, uh, then I, uh, there were some struts in the left lane, maybe with, with the guide manipulation, there some strut under expansion was there. So I repeated the uh, uh, pot again at uh, 25 atmosphere, at the 25 atmospheres, and and result was very, very acceptable. So this was the uh, shoots done in, in various views. Impella, uh, uh, she didn't really require any support and uh, she had a uh, hemodynamics were very, very well maintained. We waited for half an hour, then Impella was uh, retrieved. I had taken uh, two pro glides uh, to begin with. And uh, we, we closed the drawing and uh, this was the follow-up shoots, which was quite uh, satisfactory. And we were concerned about the Ilya costume, which was there was no dissection, no flap over there, so that was good. So to conclude, Impella supported PCI is extremely useful in the following subsets: advanced age, location of uh, coniatic disease, in, including left main and bifurcation disease, challenging plaque types, including calcification, long lesions, severe systolic dysfunction, and severe heart failure. Patients with CTO or previous uh, cabbage procedures. Impella is easy to deploy uh, the device which allows to perform complete revascularization so that we achieve better long-term results. I, I thank you for your patient hearing. Great case, uh, Dr. Anand. Thank you so much for this case. Uh, any comments uh, uh, from the panel? In the interest of time, let's move ahead. Uh, so uh, the next presentation is by Dr. Manoj uh, on protected chip PCI and critical rocky left main complicating ACS with acute heart failure. Dr. Manoj is a senior interventional cardiologist at Kaveri Hospital, Chennai. Uh, good evening. Thanks for the invite uh, for the DIC 2021. Are you able to see my slides? Uh, yeah, please go ahead. Uh, it's not moving in the slide format. Uh, It's not coming the slideshow format. Maybe I'll have to open it again and see. Could you get the next speaker then? Uh, okay. Start? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so the next speaker is Dr. Anand Raman from the same hospital. He is uh, going to talk about uh, Impella and cardiogenic shock uh, heart recovery program. Could you unshare, Manoj? Yeah. I'll stop sharing. Okay. Dr. Antraman. Dr. Antraman, are you there? I am here. Uh, good evening, Michelle. And uh, firstly, greetings and uh, respects to Dr. Sheth, Dr. Pravin Chandra, all my seniors, and uh, for sort of being in this program. And uh, thanks to Abiyamed for this. Now, I'll share my screen. And this one, it's not a PCI case, and this I'm presenting on the request of Abiyomed specifically pertaining to this uh, COVID situation. Uh, 
Uh, can you see my slides, Vishal? Yeah, please go ahead. All right. Good. Um, now, obviously, uh, the cardiogenic shock, it has to be a program based, as uh, Dr. Lee has clearly showed, uh, how good it works in QE. And uh, that is the way forward for us in India. And it can happen uh, with a sort of good coordination. Now, we have started a program at Gaveri Hospital. There are four interventional cardiologists, cardiothoracic support team, critical care team, all the sort of full team is there now. And uh, because of this COVID, uh, the formal sort of initiation didn't happen, but obviously cases are happening under this uh, heart recovery program team. Now, this is the uh, Asia Pacific's first case of uh, impella assisted uh, recovery of acute uh, COVID-19 fulminant myocarditis. Uh, it's not a PCI case, and it's a case uh, done by myself and uh, Dr. Gopala Morgan. It's an 18 year old healthy boy and sudden collapse on 30th of May, that's four days ago at home. And there was an initial CPR by the family members and uh, he reached the nearby hospital in about 10 minutes. The nearby hospital, they've identified him to be in VT arrest, shocked. And then he went into VF, about five shocks was given. After that, CPR and the return of spontaneous circulation. The initial blood pressure was 70 systolic and the echo on the emergency department there showed the severe left ventricular failure with EF 10 to 15%. The initial lactate, their post resuscitation was 17, pH was 6.9. So they've done some resuscitation measures. Following that, he was transferred to us. Before transferring, the CT test was done in their emergency department, which showed full of pulmonary edema and they reported corrects five. They were not able to comment on other aspects of ground glass appearance and rest. And as soon as he came to our unit, he was on a triple inotropes. He was an adri, noradri, and dopa. He was also on cardrone because of the VT. His, uh, after getting the blood pressures to about 90 systolic, his three hours lactate was five. It's come down from 17 to five, but he was still some acidosis was there. And uh, COVID-19 rapid antigen test was done, which came positive. So he was COVID positive. He was having fulminant myocarditis with biventricular failure. And the CT was uh, uninterpretable because of uh, severe sort of heart failure features. What next? So we had a lot of discussion and uh, we decided that uh, we will give uh, MCS so that we can get rid of these inotropes. And uh, obviously the neurology side, we won't know until uh, the heart and uh, sort of lung recovers. So with that plan, um, he was taken to the lab and this part I miss, uh, sort of skip it because already Dr. Lee has covered it. If you are going to run a program, uh, you have to make sure that uh, you have an early sort of hemodynamic support and it should be based on our uh, catheterization, right heart catheterization. I'll skip this, this is all already covered to get the outcomes, good outcomes. Now this one slide which shows that Apart from your uh, PCIs and AMI-related cardiogenic shock in myocarditis, specifically in myocarditis, <clears throat> it is much better. Impella proves much better than ECMO. And in some cases, you have to have both Impella and uh, sort of ECMO if you don't have the RP system, which we don't have at the moment. So it is better to have Impella if you have RV dysfunction. But certainly it is the first choice of MCS in acute myocarditis. So this is what happened after discussing in the family, it was taken to the cath lab, just a couple of shots of coronaries, normal because in the COVID situation, even though it's young, we are seeing multiple patients coming with coronary thrombosis. So that was the reason for doing a couple of pictures. Right out study was done. The cardiac power uh, output was 0.5. So it's suggesting severe and the PAPI was 0.8. So we decided to go ahead and uh, put a impella CP 3.5 and uh, reassess the PAPI after 24 hours. If needed, we'll add ECMO to make it the ECPLA for RV support as we don't have an RP in this country. So Impella was implanted through the left femoral artery approach. All inotropes were stopped within two hours of uh, starting the Impella. And this was the initial echo, dilated. For the purpose of time, I'll uh, keep the videos, but a very severe LV dysfunction as you can see. So this is the uh, first write out was done. Swan was put and impella was put after that. Now this is post impella after four, four hours of post impella. 
echo was done in CCU. You can see there was a little bit of improvement in his uh, LV, but still the CPO was 0.6, PAPI was 0.8, but lactate has started coming down from 5 to 2.5, and the impellor position was satisfactory. And this is the X-ray 24 hours later, which looks completely different to what it was on admission. Obviously, all the pulmonary edema more or less is cleared. And here it doesn't appear to be much COVID, uh, but obviously I will show the later CT what happened. And uh, this is at uh, 24 hours. The LV is certainly starting to improve. By this time, he had IV immunoglobulins and uh, steroids apart from the mechanical subcluid support with the impel up. So the CP was increased from 0.6 to 0.8. PAPI has also improved. And the echo also showed that APSI was improving. So there was no necessity for the ECMO addition. Already the RV was improving. The lactate was coming down to one. So that is 24 hours. And this is third day on Impella. EF is 48%, CPU was 0.9, PAPI was 0.9, and lactate was 0.8. A dramatic improvement. And this is uh, day four today. EF was 50%, and CPU was more than one, PAPI was 0.93, lactate was 0.8. So we were able to explain the Impella today. Following explantation, he had a CT chest done, which unfortunately shows there is 50% lung involvement. This is probably the downside of uh, the steroids uh, given earlier for the myocarditis. Um, obviously, there was uh, COVID positivity, but maybe steroid is flared it. And he also had IV immunoglobulin. So whether that is the case or whether it's a natural progression of the COVID, which happens on fourth, fifth day in the lungs. Uh, now it is 50% lung involvement. MRI brain shows there is hypoxic injury. So he's planned for a tracheostomy tomorrow on neuro rehabilitation. But as far as the cardiac side is considered, con dramatic improvement in four days with the MCS support, getting rid of the inotropes. And this was the first of the Asia Pacific case and clearly shows Impella is the choice in those cases. And in India, you can add ECMO if you are having RV dysfunction. So this is already discussed by our colleagues. If you are going to have a program, shock program, it is better to have a team-based program, a protocol based where you have proper assessment with right out catheter and uh, sort of device uh, decision making by the heart team and addition of uh, either ECMO or RP device when we have them. So for purpose of time, I'll skip all this. So I thank uh, the whole team and uh, the heart recovery program at Kaveri Hospital. Thank you. Great case, uh, Anand, because this was, uh, you know, uh, a patient who was almost, uh, he, had, he was dead. And then uh, uh, the recovery, uh, when you support the heart, you've shown excellent uh, way that, you know, the, the heart recovers and the patient is able to uh, be, lead a normal life we wish him that he has a good neurological recovery as well and then he survives well. Uh, Dr. Manoj, are you able to uh, go ahead now? Yeah, I'll start the, let me see whether it's screen share. Are you able to see the slides? I'll Not stop yet. sharing. Okay. Yeah, we're seeing the slides. Okay. No. It's taking some time, man. Yeah. Able to see? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. So there are two cases that I would like to present and thanks for the invite once again. Uh, the first case, uh, many people would have seen in various uh, forums having presented. And um, I'll go to the, yeah, this is a 81 year old gentleman who used to walk about seven kilometers every day, presented with fast progressing angina, limiting his day-to-day -day activities because of the angina. He had a variable blood pressure in the upper and lower limb indicating peripheral arterial disease, multiple comorbidities, was on a pacemaker, he had atrial fibrillation on dabigatran, COPD with obesity and or, uh, obstructive sleep apnea with a CKD at baseline and anemia as well. His first echocardiogram on admission showed a normal LV with EF of 58%, no mitral regurgitation. Troponin I was normal, so he was managed as an unstable angina. CT diagram was done because of peripheral arterial disease and showed a significant occlusion of uh, all the mesenteric and visceral vessels and also total occlusion of both subclavian arteries. After four days in the hospital, he developed an instemy with uh, acute LV failure requiring an IV. Ejection fraction had dropped to 36, fast progressing acute heart failure, grade three mitral regurgitation with the onset of severe pH. Troponin I was rising, as also the serum creatinine indicating cardiorenal syndrome and acute kidney injury. NT pro BNP indicating severe heart failure. So these are the angiograms so showing a densely calcified left main. Uh, you could see a amount of calcium there from the ostium. The whole length of the left main extending into the uh, 
um, uh, ramus, intermediate ramus is a much larger vessel than the lady acid. And you could see extending from the ostium to the uh, proximal extent of the uh, ramus and LAD also was diffusely disease. Right coronary artery did not have any significant uh, lesion. So these are the CT images showing a proximal total calcified total occlusion of the subclavian and also the visceral vessels. Uh, as a stage one, I created an axis from the right subclavian artery by doing a peripheral uh, intravenous lithotripsy. And there was an ultrasound guided uh, brachial artery axis and graded balloon dilatation after crossing with the Gaia 3 wire with the three millimeters followed by five mm balloon and multiple uh, peripheral shockwave balloon uh, uh, with a seven mm shockwave IVL balloon delivered. And then the patency of the right subclavian was established. And this was done with bilateral cerebral protection filters to avoid any embolic phenomenon. And peripheral IVS showed that the post balloon dilatation, there was a circumferential calcification, which was fractured and much larger luminal gain after the peripheral IVL balloon because of fractured calcium and without any need for stenting the peripheral angioplasty could be done successfully and a patency could be established for a subsequent uh, chip procedure. After 24 hours, she was the patient was taken for a hemodynamic CAT study. You will see the right atrial mean of 15, uh, RV pressure of 66 by ED of uh, 15, pulmonary wedge mean of 24, and uh, PA pressures of 69 by 24 and uh, with a mean pressure of uh, 47. So the patient was taken up uh, with a mechanical circulatory support with an impella CP from the right femoral artery approach. I also kept as a standby the VA ECMO through the left uh, femoral uh, arterial and venous uh, axis, which you can see in this picture. And then uh, proceeded with uh, the left main PCI. You could see the extra support rotor uh, guide wire found it difficult to cross. And even 0.85 Nick Nano balloon could not cross the left main ostium. However, it was lifted. You can see a small uh, dot there at the left main ostium. And as balloon support, uh, it took a while, about 15 minutes to wire the into a stable position in the LED. And then uh, uh, rotablation was done uh, with a 1.25 followed by 1.75 uh, sequentially and did not show any kind of perforation or slow flow after the uh, sequential upgrading of the rotapillar. And the IVS as well as OCT images showed amount of calcium, uh, which you will see here, appreciate with a significantly eccentric amount of calcium with non-involved uh, uh, normal segment of the uh, left main intima. And the IVS measurements were also taken, which is guiding the uh, further procedures. And the proximal LED also showed a, a thick arc of calcium and also circumferential 360 degree transmural dense and thick calcium as well as a calcific nodule. Measurements of the reference vessel diameters were taken. Ramus intermediate also showed a thick circumferential deep calcium, which was fractured by application of the IVL. So initially 2.5 mm IVL shock delivery was uh, pulses were given in multiple segments of the mid and proximal LED, followed by 2.75 desk implantation LED and then uh, Ramus was treated with a 3.5 mm uh, IVL shockwave uh, balloon, and then implantation of a 3.5 mm desk, followed by four millimeter shockwave balloon to the left main for a more optimal treatment of the calcified uh, lesion there. And then uh, uh, four into 24 mm DES was implanted from left main to LED, followed by a tap technique bifurcation into the uh, uh, Ramus intermediate and a part, final part of five millimeter into eight mm uh, and the left main. And uh, these are the final images, which showed a very optimal with a very well stable hemodynamic uh, support uh, provided by the ECMO in place. And these are the final images of the, in the caudal projections, you will see that both the ramus as well as the LAD and left main were very optimally treated. So this patient uh, improved significantly after the um, impella and uh, the final images showed uh, no malacquisition, and these are the IVAS images showing a, a MSA of uh, 17 to 18 square millimeters in the left main. So dwelling time for this PCI from the start to insertion and also completing of the multiple balloon inflations and procedure was eight hours. Impella and ECMO supported wean off uh, and removed in the cath lab at the end of the PCI. There were short periods of electromechanical dissociations during the course of the uh, PCI, and uh, there was a non pulsatile flow maintained uh, with a well-maintained mean arterial pressure during the hypotensive episodes. There was a good recovery. He was off vasopressors after the PCI and discharged to home on seventh day. And this is the first case of peripheral IVL and coronary IVL together with impella and ECMO supported chip to be reported. And these are the immediate post-procedure ECG showing no ST deviations, 
very stable hemodynamic uh, after removal of the MCS support and no inotropes, showing a blood pressure 123 by 75, maintaining an oxygen of uh, 60 and having a stable uh, heart rate of 63. So crucial support uh, is maintaining the circulation by the impella, which protects and uh, maintains a stable hemodynamics, enabling successful cheap PCI procedure to recovery and also for the LV as well as for circulatory stability and avoiding cath lab catastrophe. A rotablation combined with IV lithotripsy is a valuable option in critical coronary disease with calcified CHIP PCI. Dwelling time of CHIP is prolonged as in this case was eight hours and it was mandatory uh, and imperative to have an impella to have a stable uh, support. Obviously you need a team effort with all the multidisciplinary approach to uh, look after the patient after and re also rehabilitate after that. This is the second case of a young gentleman who was an ECMO assisted uh, MI cardiogenic shock, uh, 27 year old gentleman with chest pain for over an hour at home took antacids and collapsed after an hour at home on, on the last week of uh, March and noted to be uh, uh, pulseless by a neighborhood doctor. There was a downtime of 20 minutes before he arrived in the, our ER at Calvary Hospital in a pulseless state. There were only very few gasps. CPR was initiated immediately. VF was noted persistent and delivered defibrillator shock about seven, continued external cardiac massage and also ventilatory uh, support. Blood gases and ECG was taken. The initial ECG showed a bizarre rhythm it looked like uh, a torso to me, and there was no stable other uh, could be made out. The blood gases at baseline showed a 7.3 with a saturation of 21 and a lactate of 4.8, PO2 of 17, and PCO2 of 52. And the other parameters, as you could see here, being a young gentleman had a normal metabolic profile. Sinus rhythm could be achieved after ninth shock and CPR time of 33 plus a downtime of uh, 20 minutes or 53 minutes total. And we could see a broad QRS rhythm during the transient sinus rhythm with the ST elevation in the anterior wall leads. Patient was shifted immediately to the cath lab, developed VF again during the transfer to the cath lab. Ultrasound guided access for VA ECMO was initiated from the left side and right femoral artery with an ultrasound guided. And you will see the uh, blood gases on from the left femoral artery access for the uh, guided by the ECMO. PHI dropped to 6.7, PO2 of 10, saturation of 4%, Lactate had gone to 15.6%. It's almost a dead man's uh, blood gas, uh, which we see. So this is the baseline. Now, uh, when the patient had a transient uh, sinus rhythm, you could see a blood uh, parameters uh, hemodynamically 66 by 53 with a mean of 57. Soon he went into uh, ventricular uh, fibrillation with torsad. You would see uh, uh, episodes of uh, pulse style flow when there was a sinus beat and subsequently a uh, laminar flow, non pulse style maintained. Uh, adequate uh, mean arterial pressure of around 86 by the ECMO support. Subsequently, during the procedure of PCI, he remained in uh, VF uh, with maintained non pulse style flow with a mean arterial pressure of around 89 and the PCI was proceeded and you could see a proximal LAD total occlusion and uh, with a thrombotic burden. And that was uh, treated with uh, PCI with the implantation of a MERIS 3.5 into 29 mm bioresorbable scaffold and T3 flow was achieved while the patient continued to have a multiple episodes of VF. And then finally, during the reperfusion also, patient developed a um, reperfusion related persistent uh, torsad depointers and mean arterial pressure was maintained successfully at around 89, 90. Without an impella or hemodynamic support, you would see that systemic pressures would be at abysmally low at around zero. And the patient was shifted to the coronary care unit on the impella support and these are pictures of patient being on impella and sinus rhythm were achieved after two hours and patient maintained their pressures of around 93 by 73 with no inotropes. This is a following 24 hours, his ST elevation had settled. He maintained sinus rhythm. There were no further ventricular arrhythmias. You will see a, this remarkable change in the ECMO supported uh, uh, mechanical assist uh, circulatory support with a PCO2 of 35, PCO2 of 33 and a lactate of 3.6 after 24 hours. Patient was decannulated from ECMO after four days. He became conscious with no neurological deficit and he could walk back home after the seventh day. And the EF at baseline improved from 35% to 50% on the eighth day. And I had reviewed him on 30 days and 60 days. And he remains in NYHA class one with the ejection fraction of 50%. So hemodynamic support is crucial and essential necessary for a high risk uh, chip PCI, especially when there's a baseline heart failure or a cardiogenic shock preferably ECMO, Impella, or if not, an IBP. Impella is the most effective MCS when dwelling time of the chip PCI is prolonged with high myocardial ischemic burden 
VA ECMO provides an advantage of maintaining oxygenation as well as perfusion, particularly if there's a very high risk of cardiac arrest as asystole or an unstable ventricular tachyarrhythmia and rhythm. Selection of hemodynamic support would depend on the clinical comorbidity and features. VA ECMO and impella could possibly be an almost ideal to unload the left ventricle and team effort is superior and paramount to have achieve uh, the patient's uh, outcome in a much better fashion. So impella experience is compelling us for its use in AMICS as well as in chip PCI with heart failure. I would leave you with these comments from Spencer King who said, patients in Mount Sinai cat lab after cardiovascular collapse during a PCI survived with good outcome, but not because of luck, but due to the expertise of the operators and the system geared and equipped to take care of the anticipated life-threatening uh, complications. Thank you so much for allowing me to present these two cases of uh, chip PCI. So great case. Yeah. yeah, great cases, Manoj, great cases. Well done. I think the last save uh, has been, been, been very, very complimentary for that, uh, taking that up, doing it appropriately, apart from one thing. You did a great case. You actually saved the life. And you did it systematically and well. I wouldn't, I wouldn't have put a mirror, that's all. <laughs> I'm mean, a young gentleman, so I thought I don't want to. You, you know, you have, you must remember that if you don't optimize, if you don't have OCT, then you're taking a chance and your single chance, a metallic stent for a life saving is not so bad, but then we can leave that aside. He's doing well. You yeah, this patient had a, I was guided uh, PCI during that time. So I didn't show those pictures. Maybe in another forum, I would share yeah. that. Yeah, but we know that it's more tedious. Uh, yeah. We can't deny that. And we're saving his life rather than talking about what happens in 10 years and 15 years. We don't know whether he's going to live in the next five days. There's a difference in that. Yeah, absolutely. So, so I think yeah, you've we didn't balance. guarantee him his neurological recovery, but uh, yeah, you have to balance the risk, had risk a, versus benefits uh, of everything that you do at that time, which was very nicely done, very beautifully done. But that's the only thing which doesn't fit in my my psyche of doing the systematic way of uh, saving lives rather than saying what is going to happen in ten years' time. Uh, b before that, it hasn't got any benefits. It may have benefits in 10 years too. So, uh, Dr. Said, are you advocating a devil's advocate here? No. It is, it is a cardiogenic shock where you have a 50% mortality in the next few days versus a 10, 5 to 10 year benefits. Remember? That's what it's all about. Well, so you are the father of our. Oh, I am. So, I say bioresorbable stents is great. Now, we're not going to get into the discussion of bioresorbable okay. scaffolds, but okay. you know that the data gets better and better as time goes on over a much prolonged period of time, rather than one year and two years and three years. So that's what I, I'm, 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 I'm saying, that when you start having a cardiogenic shock on the table, you've got ECMO, as well as impeller, then you're not looking at his 10 and 15 year outcomes. You're looking at his, his, his discharge from hospital. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, uh, but I think it was, it, was, it was incredibly done. These are the sort of cases which make you feel that these devices, that you have to understand the management, you have to appropriately use the devices early at the right time. And you have to be fully out there with every aspect of understanding. And believe me, cardiogenic shock is not just devices. It's understanding the cardiogenic shock, knowing what to use at the appropriate time, knowing to use it earlier, that's the only way you can afford to change the outcome. And it's a multi, multi speciality approach to keeping these patients alive rather than a single man's uh, expertise. It's the thought process and it's the understanding of hemodynamics. So I think, well done, Manoj. I hope you continue to do good work. Thank uh, you. Thank you. This patient was COVID 19 uh, uh, non detected. He had a poly substance abuse uh, for nearly 12 years. Uh, from the age of 15 years before he left his uh, schools. So he has been well rehabilitated and he has abstained from those habits right now. So one problem you have created, Dr. Said, today, the image problem of us. The kind of cases you have done, and uh, Manoj and Anandram, we are feeling that we are just doing a uh, kind of uh, palliative PCI. You people have shown such a beautiful elegant, uh, thought-provoking, life-saving procedures, hats up to you. I mean, it boosts up tremendous kind of confidence on us. 
for the people who have watched it and sure they will they have gained a lot thank you sir hazra at other forums you show cases where we say wow what a great job he does <laughs> so i think all, all of us are in the same same situation of doing the best for our patients with best of our skills and the abilities and the techniques available to us and the devices available to us i know that we're all learning from each other all the time getting skilled getting better and i think this is the sort of forum where we actually exchange ideas we i wish we had more time for interaction more time for for discussions but we are actually over time so i think we should have at least 5 minutes more of discussion we're not so badly over time it's only 18 minutes over time so we could actually have another 5 minutes for discussion so and nothing's better than exchanging views and ideas so seth over to you michael and and others vishal your comments your comments So I just you moderating without comment. comment. Very, very impressive work by all the colleagues uh, uh all the colleagues from, from in India and Dr. Lee in Hong Kong just really amazing work that's being done from uh individual cases the covid treatment and the, and I I thought uh, I just would th- just urge everyone to to take Dr. Lee's suggestion of measuring your own outcomes and then reassessing over time because I think that's a wonderful thing to share data and and show what you've learned and what the impact is on on patients. He he highlighted it as as a value for making a, a case for reimbursement but it's also just valuable obviously for quality and, and improving outcome for patients. So all I right. thank you all very much for including me and it was delightful and, and a phenomenal case selections. Thanks very much. Um this is for uh, Dr. Sheth. Good evening sir. Good evening. Good evening aunt. I think uh, under your guidance we should have a registry. Uh, I, I do you agree with that? I 100%. absolutely because now the numbers are increasing and there is a great learning forum and unless we have a registry where we enter all these patients into one all mechanical circulatory support in the indian setup and show our outcomes uh, to our own colleagues as well as outside india it will be very difficult from mm-hmm. the learning perspective and as well as uh, from improving uh, what we are doing Uh, especially like when rp devices are been used for ages in other places we are struggling to get an approval in this country that is really really bad the companies are coming and asking us to give letters to cdc so whatever it's sort of directorates to get approval that is completely wrong because these devices have got ca approval fda approval it's been widely used especially in this covid situation there are lots of patients rv dysfunctions which definitely will benefit from these devices so unless we create some kind of register uniform platform where we show our outcomes and where we fight with our uh, sort of uh, directors especially people like you uh, it will be difficult for us to get approvals i'm very very clear that you have actually nailed it right on the head we need to get together we need to create the registry and we need to and and the the biggest excitement in our lives and at least certainly in my lives is that when a young a second young gen takes over and does some fascinatingly good stuff then we know that we've actually got there uh you know it's from the days of the first live transmission ever which happened from india in 2003 that i took that stage to to do things on the world stage which nobody had ever seen and nobody had ever done to now the second gen taking over will have to give up egos otherwise we won't move ahead and therefore i do believe that the future lies in young gen getting together and believing that they've got we got to do some good work together give up egos give up who's who's uh, who's achieved what and just say anybody who coordinates examines get together our data it's all together let's put it on the world stage let's understand from it let's do better and let's put it on the world stage because the expertise of india is far more phenomenal than what can be achieved in many of the countries across the world and that is seen from the cases which have been demonstrated here and the understanding and the expertise and i think it's time for that registry coming out in multiple directions but certainly it's easily done for mechanical circulatory support in its nascent phase with everybody taking on their first few cases but actually taking on the most difficult cases as the first few cases Uh, uh, so i had so asked a question uh, to dr lee what percentage of his chip pci with a non depressed lv he would have chosen mcs particularly impella because it finds it more difficult with when you have a depressed lv we can uh, uh, find ourselves as a much more compelling indication but uh, with a non depressed lv and what criteria he would apply in such cases for using uh, mcs impella 
when the LVE function is normal? Uh, I, I think um, very rarely, maybe, uh, when you see a single surviving vessel in a normal LV function, then you have, if you do, uh, have to do a PCI for that single surviving vessel, that's the time that you should consider uh, this mechanical device. And as uh, well as uh, for those lesions that you think you will use uh, arthrectomy devices up front, then uh, probably uh, you want to achieve a, a good result. Calcify lesions, you, just, you don't just want to balloon it and then put a stand in and then go. You want to optimize the result. T triple vessels, severely calcified lesions, even if the LV function is good, probably those are patients that you want to do a, a lot more work to achieve good results. That's the kind of patient that I would use uh, these mechanical support devices, even if uh, the LV function is normal. So, so Manoj, uh, in my, my opinion, uh, that completely relies not on the, on the ejection fraction, that relies clearly on the lesion and the patient himself. The patient could have chronic renal disease. The patient could be extremely elderly, prone to complications, and the vessel and the lesion could be highly complex. So it relies more on the work you're going to do inside the coronaries and, and the consequences of it to maybe his renal function and other things than just the fact that his ejection fraction is normal. The more you work on these lesions, the more you try and optimize, the more atherectomy, rotational atherectomy, IVLDU, more you inflate the balloon, the more depressed his last remaining vessel would actually be. And that's what gives you the comfort of having him on impella to be able to do a good job with multimodality plaque modification and get an optimal result on that last remaining vessel. You've got to remember so that. Thankful for but, both of but, you but, for but answering that. But if it was a discrete, even in a dominant last remaining circumflex with a normal ejection fraction, you had a 10 millimeter non-calcified 3.5 milli, 3 millimeter vessel. God, you know, you, you won't even, the vessel won't even know that you've been there and you put in a stent. You understand? But, but yet you have a tortuous calcified lesion, which was like 40, 40 millimeters long, which you had to rotoblate as well as as IVL, then you, you're going to, the patient's going to succumb during your, your therapy. Yeah, no, thanks for uh, both of you uh, enlightening on this because it's a complex patient and a complex lesion that makes us make that decision. Yeah, in MCS not, not a rejection. And patient. possibly many other listeners would have also uh, enriched by the knowledge shared on this platform. Uh, also, I, I was thrilled by the, um, the complexity of the cases that have been shown and the enthusiasm that uh, all the Indian cardiologists uh, has, has uh, proved to ourselves. So while you're thinking of your registry in India, I think what we should do is sort of in, on a sort of AP basis from the APSIC. Actually, we so, sort of should think of sort of like the uh, 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 national CSI sort of like AP CSI. Right. So some of the best practice protocols that we can do, or as we discussed before, some consensus statement on cardiogenic shock. Let's do that. That's, you yes. see, my, Michael- That's what we should uh, do. Uh, in, we should just APSIC. bring that up that uh, Michael is the president elect of the APSIC as I'm the president, uh, and he would take over from me in a year and a half time but we've been working very closely, integral to the leadership of APSIC, that we work very closely. So this, uh, this is one of those ideas, which is not just, he's not reflecting just during my presidency, but also reflecting the fact that if APSIC puts together uh, 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 a major guy, you know, at least guidelines around uh, CSI, then we actually have something which transfers and carries on. I think it's a great initiative, great idea, and we'll work together on this and get some of the, some of the good experts from each country involved into, into this. Thank you, Michael. I think that will be the best thing forward for us. Yeah. Excellent. Vishal, over to you, if any, nobody has any other comments or questions. Yeah, I think this was a great program. We have had uh, close to 1,200 uh, plus audience uh, to this uh, session. And uh, we've had uh, wonderful presentations. 
uh, over to you vijay uh, for closing remarks thank you so much uh, for this wonderful session today uh, and it is a great evening for all of us that we have experienced such an exciting uh, cases uh, from india as well as from international uh, thank you so much dr michael lee dr said pilazarian uh, for your uh, for accepting us uh, our invitation even though this is a different time zone for you early morning for dr said and late night for dr michael lee okay uh, um, uh, from bottom of my heart and uh, from the entire transumina and debiomet team and from this indian uh, experts <laughs> from india uh, the, thank you so much to both of you and on behalf of transumina and debiomet i would like to uh, thank especially go to dr said for accepting our invite to be a chairperson and uh, uh, sharing your uh, expert uh, opinion as well as your uh, uh, expertise on the single access because this is something new to uh, to us in india for for all of for all the the uh, interventional cardiologists and the uh, audience so the for me it is uh, i'm still uh, filled with joy after this presentation seeing such an amazing cases uh, happening in india thank you so much dr anand raman dr Ram, uh, manoj uh, dr sharath reddy dr jimmy george dr shiva kumar and dr hazra uh uh thank you so much uh, for uh, for your active participation in this session yeah, i know uh, we have uh, short up almost half an hour uh, uh, uh with the timeline but uh, since it was such a good interaction going on so we have not stopped or we have not uh, intervened in between so the a great learning experience for all of us uh thank you so much uh, for your great presence and uh, have a nice evening Uh, hopefully uh, to see all of you uh, very soon in person as the covid restrictions will be over um, over to you dr uh, vishal thank you so much with that uh, we close the session good night thank you good night everyone thank you thank you thank you all bye bye thank you the first time i heard a lot of confusion about dr seth and dr seth Sorry, sir. <laughs> I'm really very sorry because uh, I was not able to understand. How to he's he's the real doctor, sir. <laughs> so, so I'm very oh, sorry, sir. Uh, <laughs> okay. Bye bye. Bye bye. Have a nice evening, sir. Bye. Good night, sir. Bye bye.